I will call tonight's meeting to order. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, okay. So I'll, I'll call tonight's meeting to order at 6.30. And uh, <clears throat> first, we have, we have one council member who is uh, here remotely. So uh, Donna, I'd ask you to uh, identify yourself. Oh, and you are muted. Are you good? It's it's happening. Okay, try it now. Yes, Donna Bate, District One. Great, excellent. Okay, I'll mention briefly logistics. We are here. Uh, for the first time since the flood in the uh, council chambers. I'm, I think we're all very happy to be back here. Um, we will be um, taking comments from, uh, from the public and from uh, in, the, in the room and also uh, remotely. Thank you, turn your phone. Sorry. Yeah, there you go. If uh, we would ask that okay. everyone who is participating. Bill looks like he has mandate. Mute yourself. Okay, we'd ask everyone who's participating remotely to uh, change your name display to your first and last name so that uh, we can see and have a record of who's uh, who's coming to us. And uh, for all topics on the agenda or or not on the agenda, we uh, ask members to limit or members of the public to limit yourself to uh, to three minutes and. Uh, Councillor Bate will assist us with the uh, with the timekeeping with the yellow and a red uh, signal. Yellow at when there's one minute left to go, and red when your time is up. Um, now we will begin by uh, approving the agenda. Uh, has everyone had a chance to review the agenda and have any proposed changes? Okay. We'll consider the agenda to have been approved. Next item on the agenda is general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any subject that is not on the agenda. And again, we ask that you, one, be recognized by the chair, two, uh, indicate your name and where you live, and then Limit your comments to three minutes. I'll start here in the room, Steve. Uh, thanks, Steve Whitaker. Um, first, first is a point of order. The meeting wasn't properly warned. Uh, you may not want to take any other action other than your budget discussion. Uh, the minute the packet that was sent out to the normal posting sites included a December 13th agenda not the agenda for tonight. And that was correct. Or somebody went and found the current agenda, but it wasn't two days before the meeting as is required by open meeting law. Okay, thank you. Um, that sounds like is it, you're gonna dismiss it. Uh, so the, just, to, um, it was actually posted properly in all locations except the library. The library, we did put the wrong date up and it was corrected, but it was posted in sufficient public places, so it was properly warned. But Steve is right that the library did have the wrong posting. And what were the other locations? Senior Center, this building, and all the public locations. Only needs two locations. Um, secondly, I've raised repeatedly the uh, – I've got photos, but I'm not going to print them for you. Uh, I'm happy to email them to the council. The amount of trash that has gone down the riverbank, uh, especially from Shaw's, it, including the get glass recycle bin, the crushed glass containers that roll that, that are from their recycling machines, has slid under the guardrail around the Pomerleau property. I've been raising this for years, and no improvement has been made. The amount of trash that blows down, falls down the riverbank, and then over at Confluence, all the trash that the folks – beer drinkers over there throw down the bank. Most of it was conveniently removed by the flood, but that's no favor to our neighbors downriver. Um, so 
I would ask you to, you know, if you're going to put this environmental responsible in your budget and in your strategic plan and all that, I'd like you to walk your talk. Um, that's enough for now. Thank you. Any any other member of the public here in the room who would like to address the council? And is there any member of the public online who would like to be heard at this time? Okay, not seeing any. We have, uh, next up, we have the consent agenda. The, uh, the I'll re point out to the public and to the council, the one item that's been uh, added has been a street closure for uh, a rally at the post office on Monday. We will have the full congressional delegation here to call for the uh, United States Postal Service to reopen a post office in Montpelier, in downtown Montpelier. Um, I had to be here. I think anyone, anyone who uh, is interested uh, should be there. So is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Is there a second? Okay. It's moved and seconded. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. Any opposed? Okay, thank you. We are now on to uh, the main item of business tonight, which is the budget workshop. This is uh, the opportunity for members of the council to go over the uh, budget with uh, with department heads. And we have uh, received some questions from council members and answers from the from the manager. And uh, do you have anything to add? Well, just a couple of things. Uh, all of those questions and answers will be posted in our budget information so the public can see them all. Um, I think obviously we've got a group of people here tonight at your request. Um, I know that uh, public works, fire and police are prepared, more prepared to speak with you than others, but I think everybody's ready if is need be. And really uh, this is your workshop to decide how you wish to proceed with making your decisions. Um, finance director does have the spreadsheet active to um, keep track of any changes that or potential changes and what those impacts are, and we can put it up if need be. Um, so if, or if people would like, so I think other than that, it's really uh, how you want to move forward. Okay. Um, thanks. I, I think I, I did ask Bill to have our uh, department heads, specifically fire police and public works to be here prepared to make a, a brief presentation. So, I don't care who comes in which order. Um, why don't we bring the police up first? In uh, as as you're getting settled, I I know that uh, we had some discussion at our last meeting about uh, how many about where the where the money is where the funds are in in our budget out of uh out of all our city employees which which numbers just over 116 employees together fire police and public works are 80 of those 116 so that's those are based very fundamental services and that's where we're spending a lot of money so uh yeah, Can I just make one informational point with regard to the police budget before the chief gets into his presentation? As there's a subtle difference between uh, how police was handled in the budget versus fire and DPW, and that is that police has been operating. So we mentioned that we did not fund the 17th police position in this budget. We also haven't funded in this current budget. We've been operating at 16 this year and last year. Um, and that was in part because of the the pay changes and that was a way to, to pay for them. And then we had a bunch of outages. And so we had agreed we would only go to 16. So the plan was to increase them to 17 in the FY25 budget. But the budget as proposed doesn't reduce them from where they're at now. Whereas in fire and DPW, it is actually a reduction from their current 
um, operating system. So I just want to make sure there was a, there's a subtle difference. It's still a cut in that we were planning to add the new position back, but it, just so people understand, I'm happy to try to explain that again if people didn't get it. But so I wanted I wanted to get that out there before Eric started talking. So okay, okay. thanks, thanks, sure. Chief. So thank you, thank you for having me. It's nice to be back here uh, and see everybody here. Um, just a quick, uh, I know we did some budget videos and hopefully everybody had a chance to do those. So any specific questions, uh, I'm happy to answer. Uh, just a quick kind of overview on us to kind of summarize what Bill had talked about is that, yes, we are authorized for 17 police officers. Uh, you know, it was probably 10 to 12 months ago, we were down to 11. Um, I'm more than thrilled to say that we're at 16. So, uh, I consider that full strength. I'd like to be at 17. I'd like to be at more than 17, but uh, we're not losing any people uh, if we were to lose that position right now. So uh, to, to, to worry about people, uh, I think that was our most important part. So this wouldn't reduce any people. We're operating with, with 16. Um, right now we have all our staffing filled, which means we have a chief, a deputy chief. Uh, we added an additional sergeant, um, which we thought was really important because six of our patrol officers have less than four years experience. And we felt that, uh, having, you know, somebody too young to be a supervisor in our place, um, was a bit challenging and, and put a stress on them and also our PD. So we added an extra sergeant and kind of boosted our more experienced people to be leaders and then tried to develop those people. So there's there's a, a little cost shift somewhere along the way by add, adding an extra supervisor. Um, so we thought that gave us an opportunity pretty much to, to develop an extra supervisor um, and also have some good leaders for each shift. Um, something else this, this does address, if you notice the budget, uh, for police and then parking, and I tried to deal with this a little bit in the um, in the YouTube video, was that we've shifted some of our police budget to the parking revenue. And the reason for that is really simple, is the police department manages all of the parking, um, from the appeals to answering phone calls to running all the dispatch um, you know, the, the licenses, all the checks. It's a pretty heavy lift for us to manage parking. So we shifted some of the cost of the police to more accurately reflect in the parking money. Um, we're, we're still watching the revenue that's coming out of parking because, you know, we're post flood and we're trying to get back. So I think we have to watch that pretty closely to make sure that we match the revenues with what's projected. So a couple concerns for us there. Um, you know, when you actually look at the police department, 83% of our budget is people. So when we start to look at, you know, where do you cut, um, you know, there's only so many pens and pencils and computer applications and programs that we can cut. So it gets down to people um, and it it's really tricky. Um, we were able in this budget to fund more training. Um, and in my, my budget video, I presented how important training is to us um, and how limited training is inside Vermont right now. So the reason I asked for more training was I need more money for training was I need to travel out of state often to get more training. And then I asked for a boost in the travel expenses because obviously the travel then is more expensive. So those were my, my big pushes uh, for capital improvement. We asked for zero. Well, we, we asked for some, but we've We've settled for zero. We think we can manage the fleet for an extra year without a new car. Um, and we've we've partnered with DPW to use their their asset tracking software, which we hope will more accurately reflect what we need and when we need it. So that's in progress. Um, so there's a little hope there, but I you know, I think we're pretty comfortable um, not having a new car for this year. Um, when we get into dispatch, I think dispatchers numbers are pretty interesting. We we have eight full time dispatchers. We are currently full there. Um, you know, they answer all the calls 24-7. Um, we're, we're anticipating a loss of one of those dispatchers taking a job in another field closer to home. Uh, so a little tough, but uh, the good news is I think we can fill that job pretty quickly if, if authorized. Um, and I think it's needed because uh, we have one person out on a long-term uh, injury. And then if you get another person out, you get the overtime that hits you pretty hard. So, uh, you know, filling that position is really important to us. Um, when you look at dispatch, you see about 92% of our budget is people. So again, uh, you know, we have phones, we have computers, we have the technology, and then we have people. So, uh, so to lose anything there, again, it's just, it's just people. 
So and then when we get into our parking, um, parking. Parking's, parking's always just an interesting thing. 96% of our budget is people again. Um, and then, you know, two of those people are part-time, uh, some, you'll write enough tickets to make it, you know, their salary is pretty well covered. Um, I try not to budget anything on tickets. I, I don't think that's a great way to do it, but you have to at least look at the revenue and see, you know, is the cost worth it for them? Uh, so we have to just, we're, we're still looking at parking to see, is there a better way to do that? Is there a way we can save some money? So we're still evaluating some of that stuff. Um, and then, you know, the, our 3.7% in operating is just, it's technology. So, you know, do we want to have the computers that they write the tickets for? Uh, do we want to pay for kiosks? You know, I, I would argue I don't want kiosks anymore. I, I like to park mobile. It's uh, cheaper and it's a little easier for the end user, but uh, it, that's my own personal preference. But other than that, kind of gives you a little summary. We're fully staffed, uh, you know, per, per the authorization at both police dispatch and also for parking. So we're in a pretty good situation, uh, all subject to change with no notice, as everybody knows. Um, but, you know, we're prepared to, to pivot if, you know, we lose some people here and there. Great, thanks. Do you do you feel that you're you have enough people to to meet meet the demand at your current level of staffing? So so I always would like more. Um, you know, to be quite frank, you know, when I have somebody out, I I tend to backfill. Um, one overtime reduction strategy that we used is we went from a minimum staffing of three, which was a supervisor and two patrol officers, down to two. Um, so that's how we've saved a significant chunk of overtime as we're running, you know, instead of filling to get to three every time, if, you know, somebody calls out and I have two people already on, we're going to keep it at those two. It's really tricky when you have to do a transport or you need to take someone to the hospital or, you know, there's, just, it's really tricky because that leaves one person or potentially zero people here in town. So, um, you know, I would be more comfortable knowing that I had three on, um, but I also know the budget you know, constraints that we have. So we had to deal with it that way. Um, so to say, am I comfortable? I, I'm, it makes me nervous at night that there's only two, um, but we've somehow managed. I, I seem to recall that a while back, way back, we were down to 11 or 12 uh, officers. We were talking about, or maybe even had gotten to the point of not uh, providing 24 hour coverage. We're, are we back to that now? Yeah, we've been back to 24 hour coverage for quite a while. As soon as we got our staffing up and then got them trained, we were right up right away. It was a big push. Everybody at the PD was, we take a lot of pride in being there um, and being available all the time. So uh, that was a big priority, not just for me, but for everybody that works there is to make sure that we were staffed the, the way the city deserves. And, and, and one last question. Uh, do you have any uh, knowledge. I was looking at some of the uh, comments from the public about how our level of staffing compares to other communities of about our size. Sure. You know, the, the easiest comp for me is Barry. Um, you know, the population is very similar and they're authorized for 21 and we're authorized for 16 to 17. So, you know, I, they're struggling to get to 21. I, I think we have an incredible environment at Montpelier PD. Our culture is really good. Our training is really good. Our facilities are really good. The community really supports us. I think I could fill to 21. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to give it to me, I'd, I'd happily <laughs> take it. Bill's cringing over there. But, uh, you know, I, I'm pretty confident in the environment that we have that we could fill those positions. So, Thanks, Lauren. Thanks. Um, I mean, I know we talked about it a little bit in December, but you know this was a topic again that the police review committee had looked at closely, and and one of the points that was raised at the time that I thought was pretty compelling was, you know, this your profession is very stressful, and you want to have people who you're not overtaxing, that you're not putting into the situation where people are overtired and taking on shifts. And I mean, I guess for me, I, I hear you and appreciate, and you know, I think this collegial spirit of all of the departments figuring out, you know, what can we live with for one more year? I mean, to me, I would repeat, like, I would hope maybe we could budget for 16, but authorize 17. And if the state comes through with us for more money or something, that that is our goal and our target, but that we are kind of indicating that the the target is to get to 17 if resources allow. Um, you know, I think there was a lot of analysis and that, you know, you all had really kind of calculated a really good balance and, you know, a very reasonable and not overstaffed department at 17. So that would be, that would be my just one thought. Um, 
and, and just really grateful to see um, the training. That was another big area of um, the police review committee, um, really that investment. So really um, appreciative to see that continuing commitment. It's so important. And similarly, the, you know, computer programs and technology, you know, that translates to data access and transparency for community members. So I think that's all great. So just wanted to um, appreciate all of those investments that are continuing. Yeah, thanks. So I similarly really appreciate your um, the, kind of the spirit of let's all pitch in and do what we can here and cut where we can. Um, but I, I do wanna make sure that we really have the needs of our community met. Um, so, so just to confirm, we do have the 24 hour coverage now, is that right? And we would That's keep correct. it under this staffing scenario. That's okay. correct. That's great. Um, but you did talk a little bit about what might happen during the lean times. We don't have a lot of people on. And so I'm, well, I, I'm trying to really understand what the impacts to service would be by not filling that 17th. And if we could do what Lauren is suggesting and say that we're authorizing 17, if funds allow, that'd be great. But can you talk a little bit more about what the impacts might be on our community without that? So that that's actually a great question, and I'm glad you asked it because I wasn't sure how to approach that. Um, what what happens right now with 16 officers? If say I have somebody out long term, which I do, you know that drops to 15. So then what happens there is you pull from your investigation unit. Now I don't know about you, but there's been a couple fires. There's been a, a school bus shooting. There's been a few big things here in town. Well, I had to pull the detectives off all their stuff to cover the calls and be part of the two. So where does it suffer? It suffers in investigations, right? Uh, so it becomes really tricky. And we were just able to put the detective back, you know, on Tuesday, right? And what happens on Tuesday? You know, there's an arrest that not necessarily was the school bus shooting, but was related to that and, you know, helps further that investigation because we had the resources to do those things. So you don't really know the cause and effect until you're actually you know, feel the feel the pain a little bit of where you're pulling from, you know, so what, where we pull our bullpen is basically it goes from the detectives to the deputy chief and then to me. So we haven't got to the deputy chief yet and we haven't got to me yet. So that part's good. Um, you know, and when you get to the deputy chief, it becomes a lot of the administrative tasks then become onto me, um, which is fine. I think we dealt with that when we had 11 or 12, but I, I think the demands in this town are pretty high. And you know, the, to have somebody that can do a lot of the administrative lift is really helpful. Um, also keeps me healthy. Um, so I think that part's important. Um, you know, so if I had the 17th officer, what does that mean to me? It means that if I have somebody out, I'm not pulling the detectives out. Um, it means that I have the potential to have three people uh, scheduled and maybe I don't fill on certain days and we can look at data. We, we tend to, you know, schedule a lot. We look at data and, you know, times a day when we might need things. Um, you know, so it would give us, I, I always call it the bullpen, you know, there's, there's an extra body there, not necessarily an extra body. There's just another body there to count on when you need it. Um, special events, you know, I, I always think, are you going to save a ton in overtime when you have 17? And I, I wish I could tell you that that's the case. I don't think that's the case. You're not going to save a ton of overtime by the 17th because you're still going to have all your special events and that person's going to be there. And you're still going to have your court cases and that person's going to be there. And then you, you'll be able to track, you know, activity. You know, when you have more officers, you typically have more self initiated activity, which you'll see in my annual report, we're up about 18% in activity. And a lot of that is because we have more officers out doing the work, right? And when you generate more work, you have more courts and you have more hearings and things like that. So, you know, the 17th is not a magic ball to, to save us any overtime. So when you look at the cost, I, I completely understand the budget and the numbers. I also want to just add to that, um, because I think you were being generous. Um, when, when, we were down 11 and 12. The the chief and deputy were both regularly pulling shifts. You weren't just doing administrative right. work. So they were working uh, all yeah, the time. I wasn't certain I was going to survive that that <laughs> year and a half period. Honestly, it was it was a lot. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Um, I saw your video. I thought you did a good Thank job. You. Very articulate. You and my mom both like explain it. nicely <laughs> you get your own YouTube channel. Um, and I, I appreciate your fielding these questions, um, especially for somebody like me who has been through this process before. And I know there's a police review committee, but um, 
you know, I come from a construction industry where overtime is just out of the question because you're under a fixed contract. Over time, people are tired. They tend to cut their thumbs off on the table saw uh, when they work late. Uh, sometimes time is money, though, and you got to push the job through and get it done, and so you do it. But when I saw the overtime numbers, I said, wow, those are really big numbers. Um, and then I saw your video, and I, I, um, you, you, you talked about a couple of things. Um, and I asked a question about, about overtime, and it's actually been uh, – it's based on historical uh, shortfalls, actually, in budgeting on overtime. Uh, so the increases are large, but they're typical of what's been happening. And so I, I'm trying to figure out, you know, how that happens. Um, but in the in the video, and again tonight, you mentioned that you you you're you're taking some steps that that might change that somewhat. Um, go, going from one super and two patrols to just two people, and you you talked about having a third person would be preferable in that particular case. You also mentioned in dispatch that um, going to single coverage or experimenting with single coverage. Did that experiment work so, out? <laughs> so, I can so that's a great question too. Uh, December was our test month. And what we typically did was we ran double coverage from 8 a.m. to midnight every day of the week, seven days a week. And then we'd run single coverage from midnight to 8 a.m. So the 24 hour clock for yeah. Most people, it's confusing, but for us, it's just normal. Um, so what we've what we've tinkered with is we are not posting overtime from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. So we would run single coverage. We had three incidents of that in December. So the, to say I saved a ton of money it was probably about four or five hundred dollars. But like, you know, as I told my kid, it takes twenty nickels to get a dollar. So yeah. you know, it, so it adds up. If, so and you I, didn't compromise coverage. It certainly cover, compromises coverage. And yeah. you, the the thing you don't know is you don't know what's going to happen, right? Yeah. So if we have that ice storm and it's there's only one person on, it's a nightmare. You know, if you have a, a, a fire and you're asking for mutual aid from all over the place, it's a nightmare. Um, so it becomes really challenging for that. Uh, you know, dispatch is significantly over budget on overtime. And the reason that they've had two people out on long term that had to be filled, um, you know, it's just it's it's hard. There's no bullpen. There's only the yeah. people that we have. And if you want to have the coverage and the two people on, it's, you know, we, we have a, a capital fire district pays us a lot of money to provide a service to a lot of communities. And, you know, we feel we owe it to them to provide a quality service. And that service costs a lot of money. And then when people when two people are out, you're stuck with that overtime. So both of these initiatives, the the single coverage and the uh, the patrol going from three to two, is that was that something you you tried recently, or you've been doing that? So we we instituted the when we started losing uh, numbers a, about a year and a, what now time flies probably two years ago right uh, two years ago we started to do that because what we realized is exactly what Lauren was saying is we were just crushing our staff. You know, they were just working and working to keep the minimum staff of three up. There's no days off, you know, and you felt like you were the Patriots there for a while. Did you have that? You have I had 11 or 12 okay. and we were trying to keep the, yeah. So we were trying to keep the three and it just wasn't, it wasn't working for us. It, it wasn't working for the staff and, uh, you know, the, the staff is the most important people we have, right? So if the staff isn't healthy and happy, they're not delivering a good quality product to the, the community. So the staff are the most important and I have to take care of them. So we made that decision to drop the coverage. I don't like it. I still don't like it. Um, if I have to take someone to St. Johnsbury, you know, uh, uh, somebody in custody, it's, you know, one person has to drive up to St. Johnsbury by themselves. Um, and that leaves one person in the city, you know. Um, if it's a female, I'm not comfortable having a male drive a female all the way to St. Johnsbury, you know, so I have two people go. Um, then I got to call somebody in to do that transport. Or do we just say, you know what, we'll cite them for tomorrow and it doesn't really matter what the judge said and hope they show up tomorrow like because we just can't do it. Um, and that's that's a hard decision we've had to make sometimes and just say, you know what, we can't do this. We don't have enough people to do it. It's a hundred dollar bail for something silly. And you know what, we're not going to do it. Well, uh, it's a very complete answer i was hoping solving for a different one but um so as i, I understand that all the time too <laughs> as i understand it then the the overtime that's in the budget for police um is based on historical numbers and 
and a two-person patrol instead of a three-person patrol. Yeah, for the last year. I was yeah. hoping that you were yeah. going to try the two-person. You can try. It. So it just, it didn't, yeah, it didn't, it didn't actually yeah. save anything. No. And so you, when you start to look at when we were doing the budget itself, when you start to look at the amount of time off everybody has and you start adding up time off and you know sick time and then training time, you're at seven, eight, nine thousand hours between everybody at the PD. And a lot of that has to be filled. So your numbers go up just with your contract obligations. And that doesn't include court, special events, and all the other things that we have. So the demands with no bullpen are, are really high. So I'm I'm guessing then that if we authorized you for 20 police and and reduced overtime by that amount in the budget, you're saying that probably wouldn't help. I don't it, would it help? It would help some. Right. Would you like to go? And this is this is a good question for you. Do you want to go back to the three person coverage, which is something that I would really like to do? You know, to do that, I would need a certain number of cops. Right. And then when, like I said before, is if you have more cops, you generate more activity and that results in, you know, results in core time and those other things, which are all overtime. Um, you can do some creative scheduling with overtime with uh, with court time. But like most courts are during the day, you know. You know, so I have people that work 16 to 8 a.m., you know, 16, which is 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. So 16 hours a day is the court's not open. So those people have to come in on their, their time off uh, to cover court. Another very complete answer. <laughs> Thank you. Following up on that, uh, when you, you talked about uh, doing a transport to St. Jay, um, are there are there times where you, you're make the decision to keep somebody in the lockup here in the building rather than drive them over in the middle of the night? Or... No, we, we're not authorized to keep people overnight. That's not good practice for us to keep people overnight. The longest we would keep somebody is if we had to call somebody in to do the transport. It's just nothing that I'm comfortable keeping people. We're not a, we're not a lodging facility. We're simply a holding facility. It's not fair to the people. It's not fair to us to, to hold them there. Do you like to say something? I was actually just going to suggest for following up on the line of questioning from Councilmember Alfano and just for everybody watching, if, if the chief could maybe just list the things that cause us to incur overtime, just in general. I mean, you've mentioned a few, but, you know, replacing people, an incident, court, you know, just so people understand why we generate sure. overtime. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we run the way the way we run most of our shifts is um, we oftentimes can absorb a person taking a day off, but the majority of the time it is filling shifts or time off, training, sick leave. There's some people that are out on long term leave. Um, I have I think three people that are military, so that's you know two weeks a month and you know a couple times a year, so that's it's a pretty significant chunk. Uh, training is a big expense. Um, I'm trying to get an emergency response unit up and running, which is, you know, 16 hours per training day of overtime. Um, you know, that's a, it's a really important piece. So I've had to slow the training down, which I'm not really happy about, but I had to slow it down just to kind of get costs under control. Um, it's a regional team that, you know, it's certainly not a SWAT level team, but a team that is highly trained to do high risk stuff. And it's, you know, it's countywide. Um, so it's been a big push. It's been a three-year push. We're on year three. I got the funding for the final training uh, through the COPS office. And uh, I'm just trying to figure out how to make it feasible financially to, to continue doing it. And as years ago, I, I would often be going down to the police academy to do, uh, do in-service training on landlord tenant law has the uh, has the academy cut back on the training that they provide yeah they've significantly cut back on it um you know once you once you get out of the, like the first couple of years of being a police officer most of the stuff that they offer is you know pretty basic and uh i think you know to you, you still have to challenge your officers you still have to you know find their interests and and kind of keep them going. Uh, so, you know, high level trainings are important. And, you know, every time somebody comes back from a pretty good leadership training or a tactical training or a negotiation training or any type of training, it kind of rejuvenates them and brings another energy back to the police department. And um, 
it gets infectious, you know, so you try and you try and ride those waves as much as you can and like schedule those trainings. So like somebody's always coming back happy and it just keeps everybody a little happier. Um, yeah, there's a certain number of hours each officer has to get maintain certification, right? Yeah. So each officer is required a very minimal amount, which is 30 hours. Um, and it barely covers. I'm not comfortable having new officers on the road with just 30 hours of training. That's if you want the bare minimum, that's not me. Um, the, the, we deserve better. They deserve better. The community deserves better. They're going to be trained to a high standard and high level. So we're, we're going to keep investing in that. And, you know, I have some like our canine, what, you know, this budget cuts the canine, uh, you know, it's a extremely expensive, <laughs> extremely expensive program from a car to outfitting, to the dog, uh, to the overtime, to the travel. Um, you know, and when we started looking at people, the dog had to go. Right. So, um, it just, it, that was a tough, that was a tough one to swallow, but you know, cost wise and activity wise, it didn't justify it. And like, do I like that decision? No, of course I don't like that. I'm probably going to lose my cane on officer to another department. You know, like that's, that's okay. Uh, you know, if that's best for him and the canine, then that's what we have to do. But, um, you know, there's a lot of things that we can do and there's a lot, there's some things we can't. And that was one of them we couldn't do. Yeah. Pelling. Uh, thank you for your presentation. So, uh, even if hiring one more officer will not affect overtime, Positively, it will not reduce overtime expenses. I think we should still hire because public needs is more important. So um, in terms of public safety, have you done any um, work with the city? If you want to hire this person, how can you find the money without creating like too much um, for the budget? Sure. You know, thank you. So one of the tricky parts is typically if you want to do like what they call a cops grant, mm -hmm. you know, you, there's a match. So and then at the end of a certain period of time, you you're on the hook for all of it. So it's really, you know, do you want to get do you want to do that and commit to that over the long term? And, you know, I think this this was a time where we just had a, like a pretty hard budget reset to mm -hmm. kind of get things back in order. Um, and I'm a piece of that budget reset, mm -hmm. you know, like there's not anybody that's going to come after me. That's not also going to say similar things that like, we'd love to have all this stuff, but we also think there's probably time for a budget reset too. Right. So it, yes, I can explore that. How am I, I looking? That you're fine. I think that zoom crashed. Donna, I'm seeing oh, you raise your hand. There's no audio on the public. Oh, okay. they missed my best part. <laughs> <laughs> Recording in progress. I need you to unmute the. Thank you. Should be good. I think Donna wanted to ask a question too. Yes, we will. I, I'm very, very sorry, but this the t on remote we couldn't hear. Palin at all from like her third sentence when she asked about having additional officers. I don't know if anyone else told you that. Well, we we just got that uh, kind of late in the process. So thanks, Donna. Do you want to? Yeah, I can. I'll, I'll ask her to stay. And, and is there a better way for me to try to speak uh, since I can't unmute, my, unmute myself? You can go ahead if you want. Yeah. Raise your hand, um, but yeah, that is an issue that we should, uh, we've been Work talking on. about trying to address so okay. that yep. you should be able to stay unmuted, but I'm not sure if there's a way to do that. We're working on that. Okay. Well, but I just asked Palin to restate what she said so that we can, everyone can hear it. If, if you missed it, everybody else did too, so. 
And we didn't hear Eric's response. I mean, I totally support her about let's have the 17 officers, uh, but it'd be nice for everybody to hear it. Thank you. Yeah, I hope I can remember what I asked. So um, I was trying to um, learn if any work has been done without creating a burden to our budget to find some kind of financial resources to hire and their 17th officer. I think that's, that's the brief that, summary. That summarizes it pretty yeah. well. And, and my response was very simple that um, you can look at COPS grants you know, through the government and there's usually a cost share in those grant applications. And then at the end of a certain period, you're on the hook for the entire cost. And then, go yeah, ahead. I was just gonna jump in on that. So typically, this might not be exact, but typically they, you know, we would only pay like 25% the first year. The government would pay, federal government would pay 75%. Then the second year it goes to 50, 50, the third year, 75, 25. And then the fourth year we have to pay. And then we have to agree to keep that position for at least, I don't know, two or three years. Um, this was, this has been a longstanding program when they were trying to get more police officers in the street. So, and we've used it in the past. Uh, it is a way to build up, um, but it, it does require a long-term commitment. So if we're in this boat next year and we're trying to cut back, we we can't, that would be off limits. So, and just um, for sake of this, just so people know a, a new police officer um, at the lower end of the scale with benefits and everything and all in over time calculated would be about $125,000 if we were to put that in the budget. $125,000 for a new officer. I couldn't tell who said that, but that correct is the answer. And whoever spoke, um, Scott Marsh. I, okay, I'd like to make sure you, uh, anyone who wishes to uh, address the council to raise your hand to be recognized, and we'll go from there. Right now, we're still going through questions that the council members might have. And I just want to clarify um, to that point. That includes their base pay, that includes all the benefits, and it includes anticipated overtime. You know, every, we allocate certain overtime for each officer given the needs that we anticipate. So it is all in with all costs, in, including FICA contributions, pension contributions, and everything else. So that is, it's, we don't pay a, a new officer $125,000 salary. That is the all in cost for a new officer. Thanks. Um, anybody, any council members up here? Tim. Tim. Yeah, Donna, do you, did you have a question you wanted to ask or, or jump in? No. Okay. Thanks. No. So chief, just trying to get, figure this out. So we've got roughly, looks like from the numbers here, maybe a, a little over 300,000 in overtime between the police department, the, the, um, dispatch and the parking. So, you know, if you kind of, you know, this organization better than any of us is there anything you'd like to do or would recommend that might soften the overtime and, and contribute better to the organization so i, I think i kind of answered it again but i'll try again i i would like more officers but i can't guarantee you that's going to save you the hundred and twenty five thousand dollars that you put into it you know can you save twenty five thousand per new pro person I'm not really certain, you know, I just, I don't know what the activity level would be. I don't know what the court would be. I don't, I don't know. What, there's a lot of unknowns in there. Um, and, you know, this budget, I, I didn't say it for the, for the renew was kind of just that hard reset. And we used the actual numbers that we were doing. And then we had a year to Sal's point of us using a reduced number of staff members to kind of build in that that overtime budget. And then, you know, we have those unique, uh, those unique things, you know, a couple of people were out long-term. I've had two long-term military leaves, you know, just certain things that you can't predict. And then, you know, two health issues and dispatch. So you, you just, when you add all those things up, it's just a normal day for us. But um, I, I often joke, you know, when I was a patrol officer and I called in, someone had to fill in because I was like, I was important then, right? If I call in today, like, there's no big deal. My, my stuff will be there tomorrow, right? It's But it's not the same for dispatch and it's not the same for police. Like, someone has to answer the phone and someone has to respond to the calls. Like, my job can stay for tomorrow. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that. <clears throat> but you kind of said it is, which is, you know, in police and fire, it's a little different than any of our other departments because they're 24 hour operations. So, you know, we have to have a certain amount of people on, or it's ideal to have a certain amount of people on to get the work done. So 
in city hall or even in DPW, if someone's out, they're just out and they run short for the day. Um, if the police are out and they get below a couple, you know, people, they, we have to serve the city. So we need people on, we need a dispatch to so call someone in and that's at overtime. So we're paying the, the sick time outage or the vacation outage plus time and a half for that person. If there's a major incident and we call more people in, that's, the flood, for example, uh, you know, that's all at overtime. There's when there's a protest or a march or even a fun popular live event, we have extra people on in police, fire, and public works. Those are all overtime costs. Uh, and so um, court, the police, you know, when they have to go to court on their day off, that's, you know, four hours overtime for them. So, you, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the function of doing the job. And, and as Eric said, even if you have more people, you can manage some of that, but then those people have to go to court. Those people have time off. So it is, it's actually, a, it's, it's in some ways cheaper than hiring a lot of people because we're just backfilling with the folks we have um, to a point. So I think you can't, all, you can't look at overtime as an inefficiency. It's kind of a cost of doing business. The question is, can we manage it as efficiently as possible and still do the business that we have? And that's what we're challenging ourselves every year, but particularly this year. So just thinking it through. So public service, we want the best public safety we can have, but yet within government, and we're going to study this and try to understand it, there's clearly an infinite demand for a free service. The public perceives you're there, okay. boom, to answer the questions, do whatever you need to do. Are there tasks, things that are frequently being asked of the police department that are stretching you but aren't really primary public safety roles. Is, are there things we could cut back on? Um, I feel like you're setting a trap for me. No, I'm not trying to set a trap. I'm trying to figure this out. Um, it, Cause I know what, you know, just listening, watching teachers over the years in schools and, and they've had to take on more and more, you know, social services aspects to their jobs. And I'm sure that's the same for police officers because I've watched it so, and your people are amazing, but it's like, but is there anything out there that's stretching the limits for your team that, yeah, you could pull back. I mean, huh? there, there's there's a lot of social demands. Obviously, I mean, you mm. take a walk downtown, and you can see the social demands everywhere we look. Right? Um, you know, we have our embedded clinician, and you know, everybody's like, "That's the be all end all." You know, that's just another piece of the puzzle. You know, and they're typically with us, and they don't have a magic wand any more than any one of us do to solve all the problems. Uh, you know, some of the things that uh, you know that that stretch our budget pretty good are those, you know, the, the quick pop-up events, you know, and we approved one today, you know, like that, that costs money. Right. So, you know, I'm going to have DPW on staff to come and help me and, you know, trying not to, to bring any people in to do this, but, you know, we have three of the highest profile politicians in our state showing up and we're running at bare bones. Right. And does that make a lot of sense? You know, especially with what's going on in the world, it, it literally makes me nervous. Um, so do, do we want to stop those or the capital city? We can't stop that, you know? So it, it's just, it's really a tricky spot to be in a capital city and then have a budget crisis and, you know, like have, a, have you know, real problems too. Um, and all of those things cost a lot of money to, to deal with. Thanks. Council members, anything else before we thank the chief? Um, Okay, great presentation. Thanks for thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. You're going through it all again. <laughs> uh, the the expertise is is great for this. All right, let's bring up Chief Gowans. Good evening. Good evening. And, thanks and, for being here. Uh, thank you. As uh, Chief said, thanks for having us here. And uh, I'll start with, um, we we are one of the departments that's proposing to reduce our staffing from 17 to 16. Um, I'll let you know that the, the, the reduction is myself. I will be retiring on July 1st. And... Um, so that without well, that's the seventeenth position that we're gonna be leaving. I've been with the department forty five years, and it's time to move on. i I would love to stay another forty five, but um i I hope my wife's not watching right now, but I would stay another forty five, but I can't. And 
So it's time to um, move on. So what does that mean? So that means uh, the, the plan is to reduce from 17 to 16. Um, and obviously when you reduce staffing, you reduce service. There's no, there's no way around it. If you go from 17 to 16, we're, we're going to be reducing our service. Under the current uh, scheduling that we have, um, we have on at, uh, four nights a week, we have four people working. If we drop from 17 to 16, that'll drop down. It'll drop down to three nights a week of only four people working. Under the current, and, and I, I, I want to emphasize, that's under the current staffing situation we have. Could we look at a different way of staffing? We probably could. We could look at different things. But so, um, but under the current, that is. But in addition to that, when you drop from 17 to 16, it, you know, it reduces by one. So that's one less person at a major fire. That's one less person at a flood. That's it's it's one less person to draw from. Um, well, I'll just start by thanking you <laughs> for all those decades of service. Um, do we have any questions for members of the council? You know, it's just an amazing record. Thank you, Helen. So it will be. Upsetting seeing you to leave, but yeah, 45 years is a great, great time, I think. Uh, so uh, are you, I mean, the department uh, planning to hire new one for you, or you are just um, promote someone from the 16, which means that if someone becomes administrative, then it is not the real 16, it's 15, right? In terms of uh, providing service. So I right. just want to learn how it will affect the new structure or like how it will affect the Yeah, I'm looking service. at the city manager. I I don't think a, a, I don't think there's a plan in place currently. Well, so well, I uh, tell, far, yeah. I can tell you the plan. The plan is that we have to hire a new fire chief. Yeah. So th that's a, that's a plan and we certainly would make that uh, available to members of the department if they are interested and capable. Um and if not, we would have to search outside, and then that could that could be a problem if there's no vacant position. Then we would be looking at you know possibly someone an existing position having to be laid off, and that is not anyone's desire. Um, but that you know we we do have to fill the the chief, and we'd have to probably have to figure out a way that how the chief. I mean, currently the chief can take calls, but rarely does. And it might be that we have to have someone who can take more call. You know, I think those are all things we need to work at. I, you know, we have six months and my plan would be to sit down with the department as a whole and see what their thoughts are about all of this and to see where we end up with, with the budget. So. Yeah. I kind of have the same confusion Caitlin did. So if, you're hiring a new chief, but you're cutting a position. Would there be like no assistant chief in the model? Is that the what you're contemplating, or no different order? Um, it would, it would be, no. I think we would be cutting a firefighter position, but the the deputy chief can also respond to calls uh, as they can now. And I think the question is, how do the can the fire chief respond to more calls than they currently do, which is not a slam on Bob. They're just doing a lot of things. And, you know, one of the things we have to look at isn't not only fire, but Bob has, you know, he's the health officer, the, uh, the emergency management coordinator. And so we might have to pull some of those things off, uh, assist, you know, assistant building inspector. So those are the kind of things that could be pulled off so the chief could not have to do those things and could be doing more in, in the building. And then we'd have to, you know, absorb those in other places. And we think we can. It's, I mean, it's not ideal, right? We, I mean, the ideal would be to keep it where it is. Um, and, but, you know, we're, we're fighting the, the budget struggle like everybody else. Okay. Thank you so much for your 45 years and everything that you do. And I'm, we're going to miss you a lot. And I'm 
so grateful for all the work that you've done. Um, also, I, um, I, we had a fire at our house just a few weeks ago and had to call the fire department. And, um, so this is, our house is fine and partly it's fine because we could call the fire department and people came right away and were able to take care of things. And so when I think about reducing the number of people who can actually show up when somebody calls 911 because there's a fire, uh, it makes me really nervous and uncomfortable. And um, what happened at our house was an electrical wire coming into the house caught on fire. And so after that was out, the firefighters stayed at the house waiting for Green Mountain Power to show up to take care of the rest of it, even though the fire was out. But they said, we're going to stay here because we're not really exactly, you know, just in case something happens, mm -hmm. just in case something happens and nothing happened. And that was great. But if 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 the, if the staffing is so short that they have to say, well, I think you're OK now, M maybe, maybe not, probably fine. We got to go. Uh, I'm. I'm pretty un uncomfortable with that. And so so when I'm thinking about the priorities that we have, when I'm thinking about the priorities that we've set in our strategic plan and what the public is telling us is important and what kind of the, the actual fundamental services that we need to be able to provide as a city that nobody else can provide, because there's nobody else you can call when you have a fire at your house. There's nobody else. And so we have to be able to provide that service. So I, um, I'm not really happy about this plan of cutting a firefighter. So I would love to find some way. It's not a question for you because <laughs> I know you're not happy with it either. Um, it's just my my way of saying that I uh, would prefer to prioritize the firefighters and find somewhere else that we have to cut if necessary. No, you're. thank you for that. You're absolutely yeah. right. Um, that that evening of of your situation, we had we were we were, had four people working. So we were able to stay there, even if we had had a second call and maybe an ambulance call during that. Two people would have had to have broke break breaking away to go to the animal call, but st two still could have stayed at your at your house to assist you. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I was just going to weigh in on that as well. Um, a couple things. One, just factual, like with the last one, it would be about eighty eight thousand dollars to to replace that position, just so people know. Um, secondly, you know, I I I Bobby answered it. I think they whether they were three or four on duty, they would have stayed unless they had another call anyway, just because it's the right thing to do. And we have an excellent fire department and they do the right thing. But I think also um, just to be clear, at least, and I, I see Ken's here too, but about 80% or more of what they do is actually ambulance calls. So, I, you know, that's really the bulk and that's what really keeps them busy. But, you know, obviously fires are bigger and scarier, but if you're lying down and need an ambulance, that's pretty scary too. So just so people understand, uh, we call them the fire department, but really EMS is a very big, important part of their service. I, I can't remember. I want to see, is it 80? I think it's, it's about 85%. 85%, right. And, um, and, we, and we've been building, we've been attempting to build a paramedic program, and we've done a really good job of building the paramedic program. So if we don't um, continue, if we decide not to um go back to 17 my 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 hope would be and it, it would be up to the next fire chief that the the replacement would be a firefighter paramedic so to continue to build the paramedic program which as um the city manager said it's 85 percent of what we do is um ems so that would that would add an additional we could possibly add an additional paramedic to our program can i jump in uh, i i think that there are people who may not be clear on what it means to so call someone a paramedic or an EMT. Could you explain what it means? Sure. Paramedics, paramedics are another, it's a higher level of emergency care of um, EMS care. Um, they, they, um, they deliver medications. They, they're just a much higher level than, and so we have EMTs. Well, we have, I'll, I'll back even you first. We have emergency medical responders is where I am now. I, I, I used to be an EMT. I'm now an emergency med. I, I didn't have time to keep up with the certification. And then we have EMTs, and then we have advanced EMTs, and we have paramedics. So paramedic is in Vermont is the highest level of care. As and, I recall, EMTB, they're allowed to give charcoal, 
and maybe one other. Yeah, those. Thing, but that's, it's uh, it's all changed. There's okay. there's no bees. Or, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um and ev so we we all of our except for myself, everyone is either an advanced level EMT or a paramedic. And I would like to see the department continue to build the paramedic program. It's 85% of what we do and, and continue in that direction. And do you still have uh, the on-call squad? We do not, a call force. We uh -huh. had one time we had a call force. Your son was a member. Yep. yep. Uh, we do not any, no. It was, it's been, um, we just have not been able to find the people to do it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Lauren. And that was, so, you know, that was a resource the city had for a long time. Well, it's been several years that we've been without a call for us, but we also used to have part-time EMTs, part-time firefighter and EMTs yeah. with up to three at one point. And then over the years, those didn't make it through the budget process. And right. three went down to two, went down to one, went down to none. And those supplemented some of the times and also was a good training ground for when somebody left the full-time position, mm -hmm. often people moved up. I think several members of the current department came through that part-time program. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. He would ride his bicycle. He came by bicycle. And yes. Stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 the um the uh fire chief in the city of Barry came th was started out as a part-time person in the city of Montpelier. Okay. And has moved up. Lauren. Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, first of all, just echoing the gratitude. We'll have lots of time to celebrate you, but thank you so much for, I mean, 45 years. That's quite a record of service and built just a really um, amazing department. So thank you for all of that. And we look forward to continuing to celebrate you. Thank you. <laughs> and we'll, you'll be very missed. Um, I guess my question is, and maybe it's as much for Bill, I, at one of our previous meetings, there was some conversation about, you know, staffing levels change in, in departments. So, you know, just because it was a certain level one year, it doesn't mean that it's always the right level. And I mean, for the two that we've heard tonight, am I understanding correctly that really for both departments, 17 would be a better number. And it, this is just a reality of, you know, looking for places. And so this is not a, a right sizing of either department. This is a downsizing because of intense budget I pressures. Is that accurate? And at 17... Pretty much, as yeah. long as I can remember. Since I've been the fire chief, I've been the fire chief for yeah. 14 years, and it's been there, yes. I think mm -hmm. even when I started, I think you had four shifts of four and a chief. Yes. So 17. So, yeah, I think that's okay. pretty so much for both of these, staffing. this is, okay, I just want to make sure I understand. That's pretty stable operation. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's just to make sure I was understanding that right. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions from Kath itself? Uh, just continuing my overtime uh, education, if you don't mind. I imagine we're in the same situation here, 24-7 coverage. You're, you're filling in in sort of the same ways that that the police need to fill in uh, with with pretty much who, whoever's available at the time. Is that, I mean, is that how it how it works? I mean, who's eligible for overtime in any given moment? Right. So everyone is eligible. Um, you know, if uh, if one of the lieutenants is out, we replace for sick leave or vacation, we would replace them with another lieutenant if mm -hmm. possible. Um, we also have a couple senior firefighters that could fill that role if need be, or if a firefighter is out. But it's, you're absolutely right. You know, we have to, I know you'd mentioned that um, you came through the a different industry where we, you wouldn't fill, but it, it's not possible to do that in emergency services. We have to keep that minimum level of staffing to be able to respond to the fires or respond to the uh, medical emergencies. So we, you know, we have to maintain that level. Thanks, and I highly recommend uh, retirement. <laughs> Unless you run for council, then... The jig is up. Well, that's a possibility, yeah. I guess. <laughs> Again, I hope my wife's not watching. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm, I'm not seeing her on on the Zoom. So. Oh, good. <laughs> they film it too. She can catch it anytime. <laughs> but she's not that bored, right? Yeah. Um, quick question. So, just it's 45 years experience is amazing, and thanks. Uh, looking at to your knowledge of this, and obviously it's it's like any of us in our businesses have changed so much over the years. If, if you could just like, if you had a blank slate and you could re 
structure this with everything you know right now, would it look the way it looks today or, or, or are there things you would do differently in terms of how the department is structured? Um, um, well, as we, as we mentioned, we're, we've been at 17 a long time. Mm -hmm. And so, and it, it's working at 17, certainly more would be better. You heard that from chief Norrinson, you know, and I think you could expect that, you know, you hire, you, you're going to be hiring a new fire chief. That new fire chief might say, hmm, you need more folks here. You need you this. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking is your, your pressures are a little different. Each department is. So, like, you don't have people driving to St. Johnsbury with, correct. you know, that kind of thing or going to court and all those. So, but, yeah, I'm sure different pressures. Uh, but it's like how, just in terms of the organization, um, just – Making sure, because you also have a lot of overtime built in here. And it, mm -hmm. it, is that the right mix, or would you be better to have another person and less overtime? With Chief Nordenson, it didn't seem like from his comments that the payback was that great if you had another person for 125, but you might save 25. No, I, I, I have not a, you know. I have to agree. It's been looked, um, I, current, I did not look at it, but previously, um, Chief Lewis mm -hmm. and then Chief Snyder, two different chiefs prior to me looked at it. And found that this is probably the most cost-effective way to manage the department. Because yes, it would be nice to have a few more people, but I'm not sure that the overtime savings is going to be that great. Because it continues, things continue, you know, the bell continues to ring. We continue to go out. We continue to respond to ambulance calls we should continue to respond to fire calls mm -hmm. just curious any types of calls kind of the similar question to what i asked chief nordson but are there any service areas that you provide that take a lot of time or draw from the organization that are kind of fringe services I, i'm thinking like for you maybe it's transports um we do some emergency tra um non-emergency transports mm -hmm. but those actually those are profitable for the city of Montpelier. Yeah, okay. yeah, those are profitable. We do have the other events um I think Eric may have mentioned them. You know, we have the July 3rd and we have the corporate cup because we are the capital city. We have the do good fest. We have we have so many different um Tomorrow, myself and the deputy fire chief are going to be at the state house all day because of the governor's um, uh, state of the state. Um, Eric's going to be. We're all going to be there. Those are all demands because we are the capital city. Those are all demands on us. All right. Thanks. I think to, to, to follow up on on that question too. I have heard from the chief and some of the members of the department that I've talked with. You know, they are getting a lot of calls that. I think might fall under that social service umbrella where somebody sees someone lying down and calls 911 and it's just someone sleeping on a bench or whatever. So they go out, they run the ambulance, they go out. It doesn't, you know, they're not going to bill anybody. There's no transport. There's no medical issue or someone's in, intoxicated and misbehaving. So I think, I think they are getting, you know, a lot of that. And I think, um, you know, one of the, I know we talked about it with the council, but it's a different group now, you know, one of the, the impacts of when the police were short and had to cut back is then the fire department were the only people there all night. So suddenly they were getting calls to things that they, you know, if there was a bar fight, let's say, and someone got hurt in the past, the police would handle the bar fight and the firefighters, you know, the TMTs would be there to deal with the injury, but they get called and there's, you know, no police there. So now what, you know, they're not, you know, so I, I think they've been very adaptive and very creative, but yeah, I mean, we're all society's changing. It's not the same as it was. And we're seeing a lot of different every, you know, the fact that we're talking about funding for homelessness and those aren't things we talked about 20 years ago in city budgets. And that's just where, where we're at now. Okay. Thanks. Um, any other questions, members of the council, D Donna, I don't want to make, don't want you to feel like you're being overlooked. Okay. Great. Thanks a lot for coming in. Well, thank Thanks you. Thank you for having us here. Yeah. All right. Now we're to public works and Kurt, I see you back there. <clears throat> Good 
Good evening, Kermodica, Director of Public Works. Um, thank you guys all for uh, having us come up and talk about the impacts of the budget. Um, I wanted to start just by uh, highlighting some of the um, uh, the major increases to the Public Works operating budget. Um, professional services was up, as noted uh, in one of the council questions. Um, so we have a, a new regulatory compliance issue, which is called the three acre permit. It's related to stormwater. Uh, there are four sites in Montpelier that fall under the municipality. And um, we just don't have the capacity um, in our engineering staff to take that on. So that is um, one of the increases is to about $20,000 uh, to hire some of that, get that at least started. It's not gonna be enough to do uh, all that work, but it's a starting point. Uh, our fleet maintenance is up. Uh, about eighty-five thousand. That is um, really a direct, directly related to deferred equipment purchases. Um, with COVID and um, and the current um, budget impacts, uh, we've deferred equipment, and and so the equipment's older, and that takes more to maintain it. Um, street light repairs is also up. It's about sixteen thousand. Um, we just we've found um, in recent years that um, we've been constantly overrunning that line item. Uh, and so that's a sixteen thousand dollar increase, and then salt is just um, every year it goes up, and so that's about an eighteen thousand dollar increase. And just real quickly on the salt, we are looking at uh, at ways to uh, reduce salt use. Um, we just purchased our first um, articulating plow blade that um, allows us to sort of get into some of the um, low points in the uh, in the asphalt, uh, and we also purchased our first um, temperature sensor uh, for a vehicle. Um, and our, our goal is to eventually move into uh, more liquids as, as opposed to just uh, rock salt. And we think there's an opportunity for savings there, but it is going to take some uh, investment in equipment and um, and training for our staff. Um, but we're, we're starting on that. So there is, um, you know, some uh, <laughs> bright points for the future uh, in cost savings there. Kurt, before you get off the these uh, first couple of points, uh, with the uh, streetlight repair is... It's an increase over the previous year's budget, but is it bringing it in line with the actual expenditures, the way kind of we're doing with the, the overtime uh, lines? All right. So we had um, some uh, recent bond that was approved for street lights and traffic light repairs, and uh, we've been pulling from that bond to uh, do a lot of the work. Uh, and then uh, we had some flood damage as well to some of the wiring. Um but the reason you're not seeing uh, it in um, seeing it as an increase is because we've really been pulling it from the bond uh, to make Thanks. that work. Um, um, so then uh, the major cut uh, for public works as, as well as um, police and fire is uh, the staff reduction. And uh, we have, our overtime is primarily winter months when it snows, our staff is out there uh, clearing the roads and um, and we have on-call staff um, in the event, you know, the, the storm starts in the night or even if it's just uh, getting icy, uh, we have staff um, on the ready to come in and, um, you know, m mitigate those issues. Uh, so we are currently down two positions in our, um, we have two vacancies in our streets. Uh, we've been holding out because I uh, just didn't know uh, where we're going to land on budget. So we have not advertised for those at this point. And um, we've been filling, um, you know, the routes, the plow routes, uh, through the use of our mechanic staff, through use of our water sewer division staff, and um, one rec, uh, rec department employee. And we're currently uh, in discussions with parks to get one of their staff in to uh, assist as well. Um, so, you know, one of the Concerns, particularly with the water division filling in routes, uh, one of my concerns is, um, is you know what happens if we have a you know a week of, of heavy snow events and then we have a water leak. It's, um, we just it's a it's there's a slight risk there. Or there there is risk there in um, just having staff uh, available to do uh, both functions when you're relying on the water division to do that much plowing. Um, the other thing is reduced service. So. Um, you know, not not necessarily getting to the curb line right away and plowing. We'll always be out uh, and clear the roads, but uh, snow removal operations, um, the second pass to clean it up, that sort of thing uh, it just may take a, a little longer than people are used to. Um, 
I also wanted to highlight um, the impacts uh, in the summer months. So we um, we basically use our staff in the summer to um, to offset capital costs. We um, we use them to do our municipal roads general permit compliance. So there's outfall stormwater outfall stabilization and ditching um, that there's grant funding available for for in kind match. So we use our staff and some of it is reimbursed through grants. Um, but one of the major impacts is in the paving program. Um, we use our staff uh, to do structure adjustments. So that's the manholes and the catch basins in the streets. Those have to be lowered if you're going to mill down the asphalt and then raise back up. Um, there's a major savings there. That's a, generally an expensive line item in, in bids when we do bid it out. Uh, we've also done a lot more um, sidewalk improvements in-house, um, particularly our asphalt. We have an asphalt sidewalk paver. Uh, and it takes um, about eight staff members to operate that um, between the trucking and the running the equipment and um, you know, placing the asphalt. Um, and then we've also done um, prep work for concrete sidewalk. So we found uh, we can save a lot of money by you know, removing the, the bad concrete, um, rebuilding the sub base for it, and then uh, pouring it back. Um, so... Yeah, those are the those are the primary um, summer impacts. But I should say, um, you know, staff did come together and we did um, acknowledge that we can we you know, we can still function with a reduced position. Um, but there are you know there are impacts and there are, and in our case, public works there are financial impacts on the capital side. Um, and then there was also. Um, I don't know if we want to get in, if this is appropriate for part of the discussion, but there was a question about how we select streets for paving. Is that something you guys would like to hear about? Or I don't think we have time for a full presentation. Okay, I will I will go through all my bullets. And, uh, people are interested, always interested in that, and people are always interested in paving. As you know, we hear more about streets than just about anything else. So, So, yes. All right. Um, so in an ideal world, um, you would select, uh, the streets to pave based on the condition of the asphalt and, um, basically the, what the, you know, a best bang for your buck. So the least amount of investment in order to extend, um, the life of the asphalt uh, as much as possible. So that's sort of the first pass that we do. Um, but the issue in Montpelier is the utilities are in really poor shape. So um, we are having a hard time finding a lot of streets that we are comfortable paving. Uh, and it's not just water lines. It's also the storm system um, that needs subsurface work before we can do that that paving and, and feel comfortable that we're going to get the life expectancy um, that we should out of it. So that's the second pass is, um, can we can we pave the street and are the utilities gonna hold up? <laughs> a, th a third factor is um, grouping those streets geographically. So uh, particularly when you're using equipment to mill asphalt down, uh, it's expensive to move that equipment from site to site. So to the extent we can um, group streets in one area uh, under one contract, there's a cost savings there. Um, and then there's, um, it's our staff's ability to support um, the paving work, and that impacts um, the cost of the work. So like I mentioned before, the structured adjustments, sidewalk improvements, resetting curb, those sort of things um, go into that decision making. Um, I will note that uh, this year we are planning to um, reconstruct the water main on Bingham Street because that is one of our paving streets, and it does have a, a fair amount of leaks. Um, and then we're also going to contract out the water work on School Street. That's in our operating budget. But I know we're not here to talk about the water fund tonight, but I just wanted to note that. Um, so that's just the summary of, of how we go about selecting our streets for paving and all the factors that go into it. It's um, Like I said, it, in an ideal world, it would just be strictly based on condition and the most uh, cost-effective investment, but there's so many other factors uh, that we need to consider. Uh, and then one other update that was um, asked about uh, from council is an update on the Berry Main intersection. Um, so there uh, was a study done uh, a while back, um, and 
uh, a new signalized intersection at the intersection of Barry and Main Streets uh, was selected. Um, also, the, the state of Vermont is reconstructing uh, the railroad um, tracks uh, in that intersection that cross um, on Main Street. And um, they are going to need, so they've done a study and that um, that intersection calls for a uh, signalized um, you know, the uh, the lights, warning lights for the crossing, and they don't have the right of way to um, put that in currently. So they are in the process of acquiring right away in order to do that. Additionally, um, those uh, warning lights need to be tied into the traffic signals so that, you know, if a train's coming, the traffic lights, um, you know, stop traffic um, from going across the tracks. Uh, so with those two things where it's, basically on hold until um, the rail is ready to do their project. So we're estimating um, either 2025 or 2026, depending on when their right away comes through uh, to actually install those. And there is an approved bond for that project. Um, Are they, with the uh, warning lights, is, is it gonna be uh, the whole thing with gates and warning lights or just uh, warning lights? No, it's just more just the warning lights. Okay, no and, and Donna, I see you've got your hand up. Uh, thank you, uh, and thank Evelyn for unmuting me. Uh, <laughs> Kurt, you may not have come prepared for this, and I'm sorry I don't have my folder with me. I'm out of state. But when you also talk about the street inventory and like why some streets get so bad, you don't do anything with them because their investment needs to go to the streets that need to be maintained so they don't get worse. You know, sometimes you plane them, you you have also these different terms before you actually redo a street. Yes, that's correct. So there are a number of um, treatment methods for asphalt repair and um, and they go up in, in costs. So there are, um, there's what's called crack sealing and fog sealing, and those are basically preventative measures to extend the pavement life at a low cost. Um, there's what we call a mill and fill, where you grind off the top layer of asphalt and then put back uh, an inch or inch and a half. Um, and there's uh, what we call reclaim, which is basically a big rototiller that comes and grinds the asphalt up, creates it, um, uh, at, turns the asphalt basically into a gravel base. Um, and then there's a reconstruction where you um, remove everything, you know, pull all the asphalt out, put new gravel in, and um, and then repave with the full four inches, or three and a half or four inches. Um, so the the program, you know, the, they'll always say you don't do the streets that are in the worst condition because they cost the most, and they're still going to cost the most ten or fifteen years from now. Whereas if you pick the streets that are in better condition, you can save them before they get to that point. So from a strictly pavement management perspective, uh, you never do the worst first. But from a practical standpoint, we realize and understand you just can't do that. You have to. The street becomes unserviceable. You have to address it. And that's one of the things um, that we can do cost effectively with our staff is the reconstruction, which is the most expensive. If we use our staff, our equipment, to pull that asphalt to put the gravel back in to compact it, we can do it. Uh, you know, a fraction of the cost of a of a contractor doing that work. And one one other point point on that: um, does the uh, amount of traffic that a street gets uh, factor into uh, it where it is on the priority list? Uh, we had we have done that um, for a few years. There is. Um, there's a the class two roads they call them are generally the higher traffic streets, and there is a grant program from the state um, available that we apply for every year. It's one hundred seventy five thousand dollars. So, uh, in the last few years, we've been really trying to tie in, um, you know, receiving that grant to do the class twos. East State Street is a class two that is on the horizon um, in the next couple of years. Um, so that's our, our next one. We did an overlay on Town Hill Road. That's also a class two um, because of uh, it was getting difficult to service. Um, so, yeah, it, we do consider that, but um, we really try to tie it into the grant funding. Mm -hmm. uh, can I say one other thing, Kurt? 
could about the grant funding, could you talk a little bit more about East State? I know when I'm on the Regional Planning Commission Transportation Group, and we've worked very hard to get the grant that goes into East State and the uh, CSOs, as well as the work on the bridge. I mean, I think it's been in line almost 10 years. It seems like forever. since As long as I've been on the council, we've been trying to get the state and federal funds for that street. Perhaps you could outline some of that uh, for the residents as well as the council. Sure. Um, so East State Street, um, a component of that project is a combined sewer overflow separation. Um, so that's the stormwater going into the sewer. And then when it rains, the sewer gets overwhelmed and uh, overflows to the river. Um, we received a $1.4 million uh, ARPA grant from the state, administered from the state, um, to do the separation work. Um, and it's basically set, the street is separate until it gets to the intersection of Main, Main Street and East State, and then it combines back to the sewer. So we plan uh, to do what we were calling now phase one of the project um, this summer, which will extend from the intersection of East State and Main out to um, the river, to the North Branch. And that will separate the stormwater out of the sewer system. Uh, we also have USDA um, grant and loan funding for that project. Um, I believe it's about a, a three and a half million dollar grant, and it's uh, combined with um, the wastewater plant funding, the upgrade proposed for the biosolids project at the wastewater plant. Um, but the uh, the USDA loan is a uh, much lower interest than you can get on the market rate, so um, that actually will save a lot of money on our debt service as well as um, as the grant funding. There's not a, a class two paving grant associated with that project at this time. Um, when the time comes, we certainly will apply for that to supplement. Um, but currently, that's not funded. It's funded through the through the um, loan, the USDA loan. And the total project is still estimated to be seven point five million. Yeah, we haven't um, updated that with recent increases from <laughs> COVID and everything, but I think that's still, we were conservative when we did that estimate. Um, so I, I I feel relatively comfortable with that still. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. 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 You're so good at getting grants. Thank you. <laughs> um, just one other thing I wanted to mention, and it ties into staffing, is that uh, we are also uh, in the process of developing a stormwater utility um, as I mentioned, uh, the stormwater system in Montpelier is in is in poor condition, and um, and we just there hasn't been sufficient capital funds to uh, address it in the way we need to. So the stormwater utility will be a dedicated enterprise fund, much like the water fund, um, to address that infrastructure. Uh, but as part of that, um, we had also planned to hire one staff member, and that. Um, or two staff members, one one administer, uh, administrator, and then one um, field staff member to do um, like the catch basin cleaning and the street sweeping and all those things that improve stormwater quality. Um, but there's a, an opportunity there to partially fund that position um, at a later date to help with winter operations um, through the general fund. Um, so there's a, an opportunity uh, up opportunity for recovering some of our staffing impacts through that stormwater utility, hoping to um, roll that out in July. I don't, yeah, don't hold me to that, but that's our goal right now. Cause that was kind of on hold for a while, but, uh, but that's, that's moving forward again. Yeah. We had a, a kickoff meeting a few weeks ago with our consultant and um, we'll be resuming the committee here shortly. Great. Now you're, uh, I think everyone's going to be glad that you got more, more paving money in the budget. Uh, can you manage it all, all the paving you're planning on doing with the, uh, with one fewer staff person? Um, yes, um, uh, we haven't exactly worked out you know, what components we'll be doing in house and what components will need to go into the contract. Um, we have a, a number of streets, um, five streets proposed as reconstruction and, six streets uh, proposed for a uh, mill and fill. Mm -hmm. So there's structure adjustments on the mill and fill and, um, you know, excavation and uh, grading work for the reconstruction projects. Okay, thanks. 
Questions up here? Tim. A couple of thoughts. Hey, I, I didn't, until I got on the council, realize the depth of what you do. Thank you. I mean, everything from the district heat and public works and <laughs> the layers of your job are amazing. Um, so a couple of thoughts that are random. On, on the stormwater utility, it will be another source of revenue, but you're still being collecting the revenue from the same people we're collecting the taxes from. So uh, to be honest about that, it's going to be increased taxation at some level to deal with an infrastructure system we need to deal with. Um, and that leads into my next question is, it seems like we're struggling for maintenance with this budget, which is what we've done for a while. But we also have heard for a long time about the shape of our infrastructures in the water lines, the sewer lines, the stormwater lines, the streets. Any thoughts on it, if in an optimal situation, how we would start to, like the water system alone, seems like you're always putting out bonfires, as, as they say, with water line breaks. Yeah, I'll touch on the water system um, briefly. So we are um, nearing the completion of our preliminary engineering report, and there was you know, a lot of discussion, public discussion on that, and a lot of back and forth with the state. The state has historically... Uh, really mandated um, undersized water lines be replaced first. So non So there's a rule that says you have to have an eight inch water main if you have a hydrant on that line. Um, and so historically our approach has been to try to be in compliance with our permit and do those even if they were not the lines that tend to tended to break the most. Um, at, through this process of the PER, the state has changed that requirement. And now they're saying they want us to do the lines that break the most first. And that's great because that's what we want to do too. Um, so we have, um, you know, we have the the water master plan that outlines uh, a funding plan, um, you know, putting an extra 1% in for infrastructure improvements every year. Um, I did a rough estimate and to do uh, basically the majority of the lines that break the most frequently, it's roughly a $13 million cost. Um, I have not worked out the schedule yet and tied that into um, the funding, the master plan. Um, but I think we can, my gut feeling is it's a roughly a 10 year period to get really the water breaks under control um, to a point where we're not, you know, putting out fires and we can be a little more proactive um, on how we uh, approach the water system. So I'll be, you know, as we, um, once we get through the general fund budget, I will be coming back and talking to you folks about um, that plan and um, and how it's funded. Other members of the council with questions? So. Uh, thanks, Kurt. Um, for your, uh, well, I, I refer to you as one man doing 10 men's work. Uh, I was amazed as many others were at, at how much you're, involved in. Um, I noticed in your video, uh, you mentioned, um, and you mentioned it again tonight, that you um, you do some work around paving and sidewalks and that sort of thing with in-house folks, and that you may need to sub that out. Is that a um, is that a one-for-one -one trade? I mean, it, you're, you're probably paying more to a subcontractor to do that work, particularly, I imagine, this, this mm -hmm. structure the structure work. Um, yes, it absolutely costs more to hire hire it out, but um, you know, re reduction of one staff member is not going to prevent us from being able to do any of that work. Mm -hmm. Maybe just not as much. Not as much of it, right? Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, working on the uh, intersection to the North Branch. But to, to correct the CSO situation there, uh, the Rialto Bridge is part of the part of the plan down the road. Is that? I'm trying to remember. I, I was confused about whether that was a a city project or a state project or some combination of the two. Could you remind me of how that yep, goes it's... or how you think it might go? Right. So that that is a state project. They just um, sort of got it in the queue to start designing, or they're actually bidding out engineering services, the state is. Mm. There will be a city contribution. Um, it, depending on if the, the street is closed or not, that percentage changes, but the high end would be 10% for the city, and that will have to go into the, the capital plan. I think 
ultimately we'll be able to get it down assuming we close the the street for the bridge repair which i think we're probably going to have to it's lower if we then, if then it's lower it down. that's right yep so we should be down to like five percent but it is going to be a, an expensive project and um i really want to put a water main under the bridge when we do that because we've lost some of our river crossings um and we and we just need it to you know stabilize pressures that's something we would do at the same time that's right yeah um so the the work at state and Maine, uh, East State and Maine would would start when? What's your anticipated? Um, I would say I'm estimating midsummer, and that would or go this coming summer. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. just for that phase, so not the not the work up the hill because we we still need to, and the council needs to make um, decisions on the level of sidewalk improvements. Mm -hmm. Are we putting sidewalks on both sides or one side or back the way it is? That we had an, an early discussion a while back about that, but the, yeah, the, no, I, re I remember that. Yeah, is that de that design is still ongoing though, isn't it? Uh, uh, we were on hold because we lost our primary engineer that was um, uh, doing that work. Mm -hmm. um, but again, we're we're ramping up to resume that. Okay. Um, one other thing, in looking through the um, the sort of capital budget. Um, I see some. I see fifty thousand for um, essentially computer and software upgrades. Could you just talk a little bit about what the, what that is? Yeah, I mean that's um, so we don't uh, do that part of the budget. It's really through finance, okay. and that's basically the public works contribution to the overall. I see city okay. uh, computer network. Okay. Yeah, it's a budgeting software, so it's it's the finance side. Yeah. The capital plan is mostly DPW, but not entirely. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Kurt. Any other questions? Just Up one, here. I just want to have a comment to, to uh, the, the point about the water lines and, and the plan. Um, even while that plan is being finalized, we're moving ahead. So this you know, we're doing School Street, Bigham Street, and the state, not this year, but that's already funded in, in the works, which is one of the major break line so we're still moving ahead with priority break lines even though the final plan isn't been agreed upon with the state so just make we're not sitting around waiting we're actively funding and taking it and i think we can talk a little bit more about the storm water utility but i think some of it is also reallocating some of the funds we already use because we have that storm cso benefit charge and the and I think some of that thought was to reallocate that money. So it would be, it might kind of like a reappraisal. It might shift who pays, but it would be not necessarily raising new funds. I think that's right. right? Yeah, that's correct. Um, I think there's about 200,000 like seed money. That's a benefit charge funded. Um, but also just to mention, um, you know, the state properties that's because it's an enterprise fund. It's not tax exempt. So the, um, the state properties would also contribute to that. And they've got a lot of paper for amiable surface. That's correct. <laughs> uh, thanks, Kurt. Um, couple questions and two comments. One, just on the stormwater utility. I mean, I, I think kind of to your point, Tim, of like, how do we have systems that can deal with the problems? And I mean, to me, that's part of what the stormwater utility benefit is. It's we can like look systematically at needs, anticipate upcoming you know, new regulations and, and things and make sure that we're actually raising the funds to meet the needs and kind of tie it more directly. So I think that's a, an important way to think about it and so that we don't get behind and don't end up having, you know, big systemic challenges that are really expensive. Um, so for the SALT issue, I just wanted to say, I'm glad to hear you're moving towards some like new technologies. It sounds like there's some good innovations and in using less SALT um, and might be some upfront cost, but could save money. So that's that's great and good for the environment to use less salt, as you know. Um, I guess my one question was, do you do you anticipate, um, I mean, I'm glad to hear the stormwater utility is back on. That to me was like the kind of missed opportunity as we have, you know, as we're short staffed, we can't be going after things that can actually help us um, stay and get on track. Um, are there other things, you know, knowing there's, you know, various grants and stuff out there right now. Like, is it is it going to set us back and are we going to miss opportunities because 
you know, it sounds like you'll probably get pulled into having to do more, you know, other projects um, instead of, you know, running the department and having the vision of what we need. So just, it, it feels like we might miss other grant opportunities, for example, because we just are not, not going to have enough staffing to be going after everything or just even knowing what's out there. So just curious how you, if you feel like, no, it's, it's all good or, <laughs> um, like, yeah, this is, right. I mean, I know we're in crisis mode here with this budget, so it's all just right. trade offs, but. So, you know, I would say that the, um, the street's position isn't going to impact our ability to uh, pursue grants, but we also do have a, an engineering vacancy. Um, and that, you know, that does require me to be more involved with projects and, uh, and not, you know, seek funding. Um, we are planning to hire that position um, through the enterprise funds and really have that position focused on uh, advancing East State Street as well as construction inspection for East State Street. And there's just a lot of, if you hire that engineering cost out, um, it's really, really expensive. So there's a, there's a really good cost savings there, at least for the first um, two years, uh, it'll be enterprise funded and not in the general fund uh, as it relates to um, designing and inspecting the construction of the utilities. Um, once that position gets in, it will uh, hopefully free me up some to do, you know, some of this other, uh, pursue some more grants. But um, but I don't I don't feel that the street's position will impact that. Yeah. Quick question. I've just been wondering as this is evolved. So when you do a project like East State Street or anything and the city brings in engineering, do we bid it out for each project or do we have a preset agreement with a firm? It seems to be the one that I see all the time. Yeah, so this, um, so we always get it funded through the state revolving loan funds. There's the clean water revolving loan fund and the drinking water revolving loan funds, and they have subsidies. Um, so like the the water system PER is is 100% state funded, um, for example, and, the, and you get 50% on the clean water, which is storm and sewer. Um, and they have their own requirements for how you procure services, and we do... Generally, it's an RFQ process, so it's qualifications based, and then you negotiate um, the price. That's what that's how the clean water side requires you to go about it. There is, and I have talked to um, some of the state funding agencies, an opportunity to do um, a selection of of uh, engineering firms for like a subset of work for like all your water work or all your sewer work. Have them kind of on retainer. We haven't uh, had time to do that yet, but I, it is something I want to do um, just to save our staff time and going through this process. It, it's time consuming. There's no one on retainer now. We have one, we have, um, Dufresne Group is on retainer to do like hydraulic modeling because we have to do a lot of fire flow analysis, mm -hmm. um, but it's a relatively small scale. Um, the mention of Dufresne Group reminded me that I think in the, somewhere in the, in the per report was uh, I mean, Dufresne seemed to um, have done some, make some suggestions anyway on on funding sources, and it was almost as if they were saying they would help with that processes. That would be, we would have to hire them to do that, but um, were they just marketing themselves, or, or have we ever used a firm like Dufresne to do that, to, to find uh, and, and maybe even assist in writing grants for, you know, funding? Yeah, so they are primarily, and actually they just reached out to me um, last week. Um, they're primarily doing those revolving loan fund applications for us, which sometimes we do them, sometimes the consultant does them. And, you know, they are incentivized to do that because it turns into a project ideally, and then there's uh, work for them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I haven't asked them if, if they would charge us for that, actually. I haven't gotten back to them yet, but... Um, <laughs> or if it would be you know, sort, of, sort of a free service. But uh, yeah, I think January 16th, the, you have to, we have to submit our list of projects. Um, you get it on a priority list, and then you go through a, a scoring system on the state's forums, um, you know, based on, you know, public health benefits and environmental benefits. Um, they have a whole, a whole scoring system, and then you get ranked through all the projects in the state for all the other communities. Um, and depending on how you score is if you get grant funded or loan funded. Um, most of them are eligible for loan funding. The grant funding is a, is a lot more competitive. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. Any members of the council have anything more for uh, for Kurt? I saw one question. Uh, 
in the room, uh, Steve. Uh, good evening, Steve Whitaker. Uh, I'm would ask the council to address how do we ever consider interim fixes? School Street specifically, the heaving under the road is causing the buses to throw children off the seats in that section. The there's concrete infrastructure next to the phone company. They're settling. It's been there's a bunch of water fixes that were happening five or six of them in a period of months. Um, and the section of the sidewalk there along Kellogg Hubbard Library has failed completely. The curbs are, you know, six inches out of plumb and the whole sidewalk slopes to the road. I watched on July 4th, I watched a person lose control of their agent, you know, care, uh, charge in a wheelchair, the, the pitch of the sidewalk lost control of the wheelchair and threw the person into a car uh, fender. And the ice melts off the Kellogg Hubbard lawn and across that sidewalk. It, it's treacherous to even walk. So if it's going to be three years or more, or even two years to, before we can complete the water and sewer, I don't know if you're doing separation there or it's already no need for it then we need to think consider spending some money on an interim fix because it's it's an untenable unsafe and extremely hazardous situation um similarly if we're going to be two or three years out on the Berry street cross uh, intersection railroad crossing delays etc that second crosswalk on the south so, south side crossing main should be eliminated you know, it, it's too dangerous for people to stop for one crosswalk and it's not, not poorly painted and then start to proceed. And all of a sudden there's somebody uh, in another crosswalk 20 feet ahead. It, I've watched numerous people almost get hit there. And it's just, it's an untenable situation. And it's very unusual for there to be four crosswalks or two crosswalks that close together. Mm -hmm. Um because it's not a state and main type intersection. Okay. So uh, I'm concerned that things like clogged storm drains and trash pickup, I, I'm, I, I saw our public works people doing the trash pickup because we got rid of the contractor, but that stuff's overflowing and it's taking people off of solving other hazards. So I think we need to give some real thought to, I'm glad that, the second project engineer that you found a way to fund that, that, uh, but I think there's even a, another, uh, need for e even somebody to pursue money and manage projects, uh, to keep Kurt's eye on the ball. Um, that's probably enough. That's a lot, but I'd ask you not to just hear it and sweep it off. <laughs> okay. Thank, thanks, Steve. Uh, Kurt, do you have, Anything to say about any of that? I, I know it's coming at you on the fly, sort of. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, um, we did take over trash after the flood, the July flood. Um, it was A lot of it was because our, our receptacles were sort of scattered around and some were missing. Um, we have not finalized that into our union contract yet. Our staff has taken it on. Um, so it is a, an added service. Um, you know, I also should mention that, you know, historically the, the lot here in City Hall has been contracted to be plowed. Um, we have a rec employee doing that for Public Works. It's paid through Public Works to do that now. Um, you know, and as you add sidewalks and bike paths and everything else, you know, it, it does add up and there is more to do. Um, so, you know, there's a valid point there. Um, also on, on School Street, there are a number of um, infrastructure issues on school street. Uh, I agree the sidewalk is in poor condition. Um, the storm system runs directly under the sidewalk on school street and it is failing. So, um, when we did some of the temporary water work a couple of winters ago, um, when we got near that, you could see just giant holes in the side of the pipe. Um, and we just, again, there's just not quite enough of the capital to do that. We're probably going to have to do a you know, pretty substantial lining project on that uh, to stabilize it. So any work we do um, temporarily is not going to last um, more than 
I don't know how long, but not very long, a year maybe at best. Uh, we also have to do water line work. Um, what we did on School Street was uh, very temporary. We ran, we just replaced the very worst section. There's two water mains on School Street. We did the worst section of one of the two, uh, and it was just from hydrant to hydrant. We still need to um, extend the water main out into the intersection of Main Street, which is a pretty, you know, substantial project. We have to tie to a, you know, a 14-inch main that's 100 years old. Um, that's probably not round. So those are always tricky. And then we have to extend um, down to Loomis Street. Um, so there's going to be a lot of activity there. That school street work is this summer. Um, and so it really doesn't make sense to put money into a street that you're going to rip up in six months. Um, the sidewalk, we probably will need to do a temporary patch on that this summer. We just, with the flood this year, we didn't get to it. It was on our work plan. Okay, thanks. Okay, folks, anything else? Or are we satisfied? Hey, okay, thanks a lot, Kurt. This is a very helpful. Yep. Um, I think this point, I'll, it's a little early, but I'll say time for a 10 minute break. We'll come back at uh, 830. All right. The time has come. Sorry, sorry to interrupt my friends, but the, the time has come. Um, um, Mike Miller, I see that you're here. And so uh, you get to, um, I'd like to invite you to talk about what your department does. Um, your, your budget is not really being questioned at this point, but I think it's valuable to hear what your department's doing. And so... Good evening, uh, Mike Miller, Planning okay. Director. Really unprepped. unprepped. <laughs> uh, so uh, I oversee two small departments, so Planning and Community Development and Building Inspection and Code Enforcement. So uh, if you had a chance to look at the videos um, that were put out, it really kind of summarizes what our um, what we're looking at. Um, so the the planning side of things is uh including myself is 3.8 full-time equivalents so it's two people in the planning one or 1 1.8 in the planning department and you've got or in the zoning zoning administration piece josh jerome who is community and economic development specialist so uh, when kevin casey left two years ago we expanded that position knowing that the economic development agency that we had was um going to be folding and going under. Um, you know, Bill and I had a conversation and Josh was a really good candidate to fit. He kind of does economic development. He's a real strong candidate. So we kind of expanded that position to include that role. So that way we continued to have that expertise in the city without having to go through and um, work on a different, uh, work with a different consultant. So um, that was a good find. And then uh, I handle the planning side. So I do the long range planning, the zoning administration, uh, writing zoning bylaws um, and those types of amendments, kind of the big picture stuff. The second piece uh, is one I share with um, Chief Gowans, which is the building inspection. So we oversee Michelle Savory, who is our one person who does the building inspections. So we have a contract with the state. Um, if we did not have Michelle, uh, we would still have all of the state inspections. Uh, we would just have to wait for the state inspectors to come through. You'd pay the same fees. Our fee schedules match theirs. Her department um, generally pays for itself. Its fees cover her costs. So her department's about 100,000 or 113,000, I think this year. Um, fees have ranged from probably as low as 60 or 70,000 during COVID when things really slowed down, uh, which was rare. But when Chris was here, we'd have years 250, 350,000 in fees. If we get a big project, we can get a couple hundred thousand dollars in fees. So in, in well in excess. Um, so for the most part, that's what um, we're kind of covering. We don't have any reductions in our department that have been proposed. Uh, it would be very difficult for us to absorb a reduction in with such a small staff. Um, but our our 
budget for the planning is actually going down by, I think, like $500. And that's because uh, Audra will be retiring. Anyone who's gotten a permit knows Audra. She's been here 17 years, done a fantastic job. She also does a lot of program work. So she does our community rating system um, for FEMA. So it gets a reduction in everybody's uh, flood insurance rates. So it's gotten to be a pretty big deal to go and kind of get those 10% discounts, but that takes a lot of work. Um, and so she handles also, we used to originally was hired just to be the administrator, kind of answer phones and do finance. And over time, she just started taking over actual, actual work, work of the, the, the permits. So she kind of grew at that position. And so replacing her is going to be very difficult, but um, we've built into our budget a $12,000 reduction because she's been here so long. She's at the top of the pay scale. We're simply going to be cutting uh, a chunk of money off her salary and whoever gets hired is going to have to earn less than she does to, to make the budget work. So uh, our planning budget's level funded. Um, the other funds that are generally associated with us um, that aren't our money, uh, but the housing trust fund, usually about 110,000. Um, I believe there was a request for 250,000. We've recommended to fund it at 60,000. Uh, and the reason for that recommendation is there is $200,000 in the bank. And so we believe that's enough funds to handle, handle whatever might be coming over the next year. Um, but obviously you can't zero fund or low fund budgets forever. Um, it will work for this year. We also zeroed out the economic development funds, which were basically 100, 140,000. Those funds were used for Country Club Road. We're in a position now we think um, if we need funding, we do have some money that came in. Um, we don't expect any large expenditures this year. Most of the work we're doing is in-house. And um, so most of our economic development funds. So we have, we had level funding my budget and then a reduction in a lot of these little monies that come in to different programs, housing trust fund, arts funds, um, which we can absorb for a year. Um, but we'll have to obviously keep an eye on that. We can't do that for the long term without impacting our ability to actually have those services function. Okay, thanks, Mike. Do we have any questions from members of the council? Okay, great. Thanks a okay, lot. Thanks. Okay, and members of the council, since this is your uh, budget workshop, I uh, know that we all got uh, a memo from the uh, from the cemetery commission uh, making the proposal to uh, <clears throat> to increase the the budget line for them. Uh, Patrick Healy is here from the uh, cemetery. I don't know if you want to call him up, but uh, but if you do, we uh, he's he's here and available. And anybody want wanted me to bring him up? Patrick, why don't you come up? Come on up for a few minutes. Don't want you to feel left out, but I also want to, uh, you know, kind of keep tight on the time. So thanks for being here. All right, thank you. Um, Jake was going to be here, but I think he kind of thought that we wouldn't be asked up tonight. Um, he was he was on he was on earlier, and he's not uh, here now. But correct. So one thing I want to point out for some of the new faces here is the governance structure of the cemetery. We're not under you. We're not under the mayor or the bill. There's five elected commissioners that run the, the cemetery and trust for the city, set up by the state legislature in 1854. So it's 170 years ago. They did that for the main reason was to keep the money separate from the town. So we're a quasi municipal corporation that's run by five publicly elected commissioners in trust for you guys. So we're separate. Um, the city, the cemetery commissioners have similar responsibilities or powers as the city council is. They can go ahead and put a ballot 
on the uh, an article on the ballot without petitioning and without your permission. There's always a fine line and there's there's always that friction on that fine line. The cemetery is owned by the city of Montpelier. My uh, wages, our employees' wages are underneath the jurisdiction of the cemetery commissioners. We work very close with the city and over the 35 years that I've been there, we've um, gotten a lot closer to the city. The reason why we're under, um, Bill, you can correct me if I'm wrong, why we're under the budget process is because we used to just come and give a presentation and say, we're gonna have a, an article for this amount. And then um, I'm not sure which counselor it was, so why don't you just join us uh, with the process? So that's what we did. This year, we went through the, the process, the um, Budget Congress, um, and um, afterwards, what, what our request was, was, was cut back. And um, the main reason for that is not complete budgeting for the last couple of years, because I got done as full-time and I went to part-time. We had some plans of hiring somebody, but again, that was gonna take some some money and, and to find anyone to work right now, it's tough. Um, our main workforce is the Department of Corrections. We're gonna pay them no more than $28,000 for the year. They're gonna send, they used to send 10, now they're down to six to eight people five days a week, mid-May to mid-November. It takes the cemetery 200 and takes us 250 man, uh, excuse me, labor hours to mow the cemetery once. 250. Um, I've, got, I've talked to some private contractors out there for mowing and it's well over, um, $200,000 if we paid a private firm to do that. We're getting it for 28,000. I have an, a full-time person, which we share um, in the winter time. It used to be, it was a shared position. It used to be a shared position with public works where eight months of the year, um, he would be at the cemetery. Then four months, he'd be at the um, streets, the DPW. Now what it is, is he's at the cemetery year round and when needed, he goes in for snow removal. So when, they're, when they have downtime in the winter time and, they're, and it's not snowing um, and they don't have a lot to do, I have plenty to do at the, at the cemetery. So we, 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 we evolved that over knowing that I was gonna be getting cut back to a, a 0.6 position. Um, so getting, um, so I'll stop there and see, do you have any questions about our relationship with the city? I'll just add to that. I think Patrick pretty accurately summarized that. Um, I think what happened at one point, as I recall, and I think, I think facts bear this out is that the, the cemetery had a budget item that got defeated on the ballot. And so the the question was, can we be in the big budget? And and we were working together anyway. And so the agreement that we've made and and it's worked has been yes, you can. We will have you in the city budget, and we as long as you follow the city's budget process, and that's and that's worked fine. And I think that has, you know, Patrick participates in our team meetings and share employee and all those kind of things. So that, that I think pretty much what you said. So that's. That's the the whole thing, but he's right. They could just put it, they could take their budget and put it on the ballot if they chose. That's that's their choice. And then we would have to figure out how we wanted to you know, work with them in the future. So we haven't had, fortunately, we've all played well in the sandbox. And we, we've, yeah, and, and it's always good to have friction um, and uh, because it gets a lot of, a um, lot of ideas out on, 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 on paper and, and, um, um, what I just wanted to make sure that everyone understands is that um, we are um, we're bound 
the 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 five elected commissioners are all city employ are all city uh, residents, and this year four out of the five have lot um, have lots at at Greenmount, so they they have an interest. Um, and um, what sometimes it puts my position is kind of in between the city and the 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 city administration and the um, city the cemetery commissioners and so i have to try to you know bring the information from and the thoughts from the city over to the commissioners um, and as you know when you're a board you can't you don't know um the qualifications to be on a board is basically you're a registered voter um other than that you you may have finance background, you may not. You may have human resource uh, background, you may not. But the cemetery has um, greatly benefited from being part of the city, closer than it was when I started. Before, well, when I started, all we were doing with the city was basically buying gas at the old DPW garage on Northfield Street. And now we are intertwined and computers have come on because it used to be the city clerk, Jean Hart, if any of you remember her, would come in on Sundays and write out the checks um, for the bills. And then on Friday, she'd write out a hand check for payroll. But as computers came on, we kind of, you know, moved right into finance. And now we're in the 21st century. Yes. Yep. And so as far as maintenance of the cemetery, we're kind of in a transition here. Um, COVID put us in a spot where where the where my inmates, my the offenders, could not come out of jail. So that left us two people. And so we at that point said, okay, let's look at the cemetery. And most of the cemetery was designed and built in the 1850s and the 1860s, before there were even lawnmowers, before they even thought of mowing the grass. They had size or they had animals. Um, so what we're doing is we are taking the resources that we have in mowing, which is our labor crew, and we've divided that up by half. Last year, we were, we were able to straighten out 400 pieces of granite. Either it was a flat marker or it was a monument, and we were able to get them all cleaned because we are not mowing the cemetery as um, the, what I call the country club look. Much of the cemetery doesn't have perpetual care on it because that wasn't a thing for a long time. Um, and it's a very hard cemetery to walk on, never mind mow. If you were to walk around the whole outside boundary on the road, it's one mile. There's like four miles worth of roads. There's a lot there. Um, a lot that you don't see from, from Route 2. So what we're doing with our limited resources is we're taking our crew and we're saying, okay, half the time you're going to be mowing. The other half of the time you're going to be fixing monuments, things that haven't been touched for 100 years. And, and, and the guy that works with me, um, Carl, is, is very good. Has, we figured out some inexpensive ways of fixing a lot of monuments that are leaning. And he, he's got... Um, 10 years or so experience of Rock of Ages, so he knows his granite. So we're, we're able to, to use what we have and fix, fix what we have um, instead of trying to go back to that country club look. And, that's, and, and we took a look at the, the, the grass maintenance. It's, it's the most cost, um, costly task that we do. It's the most time-consuming task that we do. And it's the most pollution generating task that we do. So we are in a transition and, and that has coincided with the transition of natural burials where people want to go back into a simple pine box or even a, a simple cotton sheet, um, no embalming, get it done and go back to the way we used to be. Um, so there are parts of the cemetery for the first hundred years um, was, there was never mowed. The only time the grass gets walked on is by the deer. Um, most people are just walking the roads. 
So we're, we are transitioning to kind of like, okay, we're going back and we're trying to figure that out. Um, we're trying to go back to the grass being tall. And if you take a look at the old monuments, they are tall and they have two or three bases before the top part of the monument, which is called the die um, with a family name on it. And the family name would be about three or four feet high. Why? And the old timers told me this a long time ago when I started was so that they could see the family name above the hay. Um, and it makes sense. So that's what we're trying to do. We're, we're trying to um, use our limited resources. We're asking for a little bit over a penny on the tax rate, which equals, if I've done my math right, about $37 for the average home in Montpelier for the year. And that's what we're working on. Okay. Thanks, Patrick. Karen. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate hearing about all that. And I, um, I just want to say I, I love the way that the cemetery looks when it's not mown. I'm very much in favor of that that shift. So I'm glad you're staying in that direction. Um, I also really appreciate how thoughtful you've been about how to use your resources wisely and frugally and very grateful for that. We did receive a letter from your chair um, that I, I, I could use a little clarification about what exactly you would like from us. Um, so in the letter, it says... We're requesting the city council restore to our budget, our original budget request from the general fund of $145,000. Um, but I see that your your total budget is that's that's in here and our book is more like 274,000. And so I'm not really sure what it is you would, it, I, I the impression I get is that you would like more than what's in this proposed budget, but I'm not sure how much and what it would be for. Okay, so the, the the money that we're asking for is the appropriation from the general fund. We also have money coming from our perpetual care fund. Okay. We have money coming from burials, um, lot sales. But again, we don't know what those burials are going to be. Um, and so there's always a certain percentage of the budget that we have to like guess on. And some, some years it's good, some years it's bad. Um, yeah. But we try to take an average... Yeah. And I see that Jake is on the on the line okay. now. And if, Jake, if you want to jump in to answer that question, since it came over your signature, yeah. sure. Can Can you all hear me? Okay. Yes. Great. Um, right. I think I think the uh, the question here is whether um, that forty some odd thousand could be restored. I think uh, during the original discussions on the budget. We were looking for 145, and now the now the budget seems to have 100 or something in it, um, and so we're just hoping for a restoration of that 40,000 uh, that I think was under discussion earlier in the in the process. Patrick, do I have that right? It, yeah, yeah. Great, thanks, Jake. Yep. Um, Carrie, are you are you set or? Uh, no. Okay. I, so I'm I'm wondering. Um, so I apologize for not being totally clear on how this. Well, we probably lays out. so this seems it seems like we have all the expenses here, and but the funding so in, source is in so a separate spot. In our general fund budget, there's a transfer from the general fund to the cemetery commission, and that's a revenue for them. And then their total budget has their references. So I think what they're referring to is that um, the cemetery's. Proposed budget had asked for about $145,000 transfer from the general fund to the cemetery fund. And we did our budget process and we kind of went through and it was like, who has what to cut? And Patrick's like, I got nothing to cut. But then after we went through, we realized that that was actually a $40,000 increase from the prior year's transfer, uh, 41000 and change. And we basically held other transfers to other funds at the same level as last year. So we went back and reduced that and communicated that to them. And so they're basically saying we we don't want to be, you know, we'd like the forty the hundred and forty five that we requested, not the hundred and five that you've got in the budget to be transferred. So that's the request from the cemetery commission. So if, as I'm trying to understand how that money gets spent, 
should I be looking at this section here of your total budget? And and it, it sounds like, are you hoping for 40,000 more dollars in your overall budget? Or are you hoping that you won't have to use 40,000 from other sources besides the general fund? Correct. Okay. The second part, we're okay. not looking to take it out of our uh, fund balance. Okay. You have a so, fund of 800,000 or something? Yeah, so our, our trust fund, perpetual care fund, endowment care fund, uh, whatever you want to call it, is is approximately 800,000. Um, when I started, you know, many years ago, it was $400,000. Uh, we've been able to double it and still take money out of it every year. Um, if you want, I can be set up for a presentation to show you exactly where where money is spent. No, that's um, okay. That's okay. okay. Yeah, no, that's um, fine. Great. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Donna. Uh, thank you. Uh, I mean, I love the cemetery. I walk there regularly during the pandemic. It saved my <laughs> mental health. Uh, and I love the tall grasses. I have thousands of pictures if anybody wants some. All the seasons, all the wildflowers. However, I do feel like I I was one who said, and I think we voted, when the library wanted to increase, that then they'd have to be a separate ballot item. And so I'm thinking again, if we're going to cut and be firm about that, if it is considered an outside organization, I don't think they need to do a petition, but maybe be a separate item on the ballot. Uh if I could jump in on that, I mean, that is obviously a council policy dis discussion. Um, I would say that our agreement, our working agreement with the cemetery is that they are part of the city's budget process. And and that's been a longstanding agreement that they won't put, you know, they don't have to petition. They have the right to put an article on a ballot yes. Yes. by vote of the commissioners. And they've foregone that right over the years in lieu of, um, I guess, having and what their benefit, in addition to having sort of a greater, better synergy with the city, but is also um, they're part of the big budget. They're not standing out there by themselves, putting themselves at independent risk. So, um, but the quid pro quo for that is they go through the city's budget process and right. they get they get through the process. So I think what I don't want to speak for them, and I will let them give you their reasons why they want to do, but. We did our internal budget process, and the budget that I recommended to you had forty thousand dollars less in it coming from the city than the cemetery commissioners would like to see. So the commissioners are asking you to restore that forty thousand dollars, and where and how they might use it or where they might get it from. I would direct your questions to them. But I, you know, I understand that. Bill. All I'm saying is, I would be really. I, I don't. I I would stick up for the cemetery here and say I don't think they should be considered an outside agency. They're not an outside agency. They're a partner, if not a, you know, a, a, a department, a quasi department of the city. And I'd, I'd suggest that you look at them like that, not suddenly put them in with the library or CVHHH or something like that. Well, I guess what I'm leaning towards, and I didn't explain it very well. So thank you for more clarity is that I just, I feel that there are things that I feel are essential that we've cut that I'd like to put back in. And so I feel like I wouldn't want to restore their 40,000, but if they still want it, I would support them having a separate ballot item. That's all I meant. Um, okay, thanks, Donna. Where so, is the line of, is it, I, I can't find it either in I'm the general fund as a transfer. Those details or, better than me. I mean, can you I think it? we're about to hear that from Sarah. Uh, budget book detail in all of your packets. Sorry. Um, so there is a budget book detail that's included in all of your packets towards the front. Mm -hmm. um, on page 28 there, you'll see the transfers that go out to the funds. And in there is the transfer to the cemetery operations. It's a third of the way down the page. Uh, 10, 93, 90, 96, 04, 5 is the account number, if that is helpful. Um, but that's where that lives. And you can see that that was the same uh, budget amount as the prior year. And they had requested that additional 41,000 and change in there um, to start. So. Thanks, Aaron. 
any other questions from any members of the of the council before we move on? I just I want to follow up on that. I appreciate I don't, I'm not trying to tell Donna that what to do or the council what to do. And I appreciate the scenario, but to the extent that that the cemetery that we consider the cemetery an agency of the city in terms of the budget process, I, I'd submit that I'm looking out at six other departments that would love to have ballot items, supplemental ballot items uh, as well. And we don't, well, you may choose to do that. I don't know, but typically we don't. Typically the council sets the budget that it proposes to the council. And um, I would hope that we resolve and you make whatever decision you make in discussions with the cemetery commission and come up with whatever number you decide to have. Um, I think I, I, I've said it. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, other departments, uh, when city management decides to make a cut and the proposed budget comes to us, they are okay with it. So what happened in this uh, situation? So why are we discussing it? Which is okay. I'm happy to discuss but what, why we are discussing separately, right? Because you recommended cut, cemetery commission, doesn't want the cut. So why are we talking about this? Why it is not like other departments? Well, because yeah, that, that's the because problem. They're governed we are by, they are governed by a separately elected board. Um, and I technically, so, so procedure. well, not always, but it has yeah. happened. And uh, so I'll let. Well, I, I would say um, the, the normal procedure has always been discussion. Um, and I think that um, this is one situation. I, I'm going to say it's been 12, maybe 15 years that we've been part of the city budget process. And and to go back to what Donna uh, has proposed, we don't want that because that's what we had before. And it confuses the taxpayers. It still confuses the taxpayers today that um, the city council has no say or Bill has no say over the over the commission, over me. Um, so we're, we're, we've got, uh, and I mentioned it earlier, there's that fine line that we need to stay separate due to a legislative act of 1852, 54, 170 years ago. Um, so this is just working out the kinks and we're, we're requesting it and we're putting it, you know, putting the, the decision onto you. Hopefully we can get that money to where, where we want it to be. And we'll be glad to come back and, and do a better job of explaining the budget. I just don't have a have it set up here. And to answer your question about, you know, the departments were okay with it. We we had we had we were trying to reach a financial target. And so we tried to find the best package of items included in the budget to meet the financial target. Um would anybody have wished, you know, I, I wouldn't say anybody's okay with the reductions in their department. They would rather they not happen. I would say that I'm not okay with the list of things that we cut out of the policy items, but given what our mission is and what we have to do and the financial goal we were trying to hit, I'm comfortable recommending this thing. That's the best package of money to do what we need to do based on keeping it at 3.2%. And now your job <laughs> as policymakers is to decide, is that still the financial goal? If it is, what gets added to it? What gets subtracted from it? What? How, how do you manage that? And I think what's different with the cemetery is that they have a separately elected commission. So Patrick participated, we did our process, and now a separate elected group of people said, well, we still want to go to bat for our extra money. And now you're the separately elected group of officials for all these other departments. So that's where it's, it's different. And, and what, and just one other thing to follow up on it's this $40,000 isn't a cut. It's an increase that they wanted that they didn't get. As I understand. Lauren, you had your hand up. Yeah. Thanks. This has been helpful to get 
reoriented to the <laughs> this relationship, which is a little um, unusual. Um, I guess for, you know, as we go into the final couple of weeks of making these decisions, the thing that I'm not crystal clear on, and it might be what Carrie was asking is, you know, what what is the urgent need for that additional 40,000 that's more important than, you know, the police cuts and the emergency responder cuts and the other thing, the parks department cuts and, you know, NYCC is on the chopping block. Like there's cuts in every department um, pretty much and, you know, lots of urgent community needs. So I guess like the case I would need to hear is what is, what is not going to be done because of this, that, you know, in this really tight um, budget year following you know, a natural disaster in our community is is not going to be done. That would be, you know, jump to the top of the list to get added back in. So I guess that would be what I haven't yet heard, like clarity on what exactly it's needed for, and then could process it in terms of how we would prioritize. So my answer to that is, um, let me bring that question back to the board, because again, I'm stuck between city administration, cemetery commissioners, and I don't want to guess for them. And then we will let you know what. Uh, so let me just rephrase what, what you were both asking is, if we don't get that money, what what are we going to do? What what effect will it have on our service? Right. And, and Jake, you're here. I don't know if you have an answer to that question now or uh, or not. You have to get unmuted. Yes. You should be able to unmute yourself now, Jake. There we go. Uh, yeah, I think it would be helpful if we could go back to the commission and, and come back to you with a, uh, some specifics on that. Um, okay, totally fair. If that, if that works, if you can, can manage that on the time, time frame you're working on, that'd be helpful for us. Okay, totally fair. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick and Jake for right. being here. Thank you. And again, if you have any questions, call me on my office door in the archway. It says, call me anytime. Okay. And it gives my cell phone. Okay. So, you know, um, the, the commissioners take their job really serious and they have their blinders are just on one department, not like yours, where you have much, much yep. bigger departments. And, mm -hmm. and okay. Uh, Thanks. So, thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Jake. So, Sarah, would you like to come up and join us? <laughs> I don't have any questions for you or anything yet, but I just think that uh, that maybe where we're going. So... Council members, uh, I've, <laughs> well, I think it's great that we have a finance department that is on top of our money. Um, and I don't think we need to take a lot of time with that unless people want to, but I think we're, I think we're good. Good. I think you're good. <laughs> um, so council members, we're, uh, we're starting from the, uh, the budget that we heard last time and we are uh and we voted to go forward on that budget and so now we're at a point where we can talk about what we want to do and that there are obviously three possibilities stay exactly where we are go higher or go lower and I'd like to get uh, hear from people on what what you would like to do. If there are things you want to eliminate, things you want to add, and let's just start rolling. I hear yeah. Lauren asked one question. Um, Carrie had asked at a previous meeting about income sensitivity, and I was wondering if those numbers had been pulled yet or if we'd have that yes i just i can email you yeah, we, what that is i'm sorry 
That's okay. It's just, it's a very big factor to me because a lot of what I hear, I mean, that's just so a big consideration is how is this yeah, impacting the most right before the holiday, lowest income you know, folks in the community? And yep, so that's on us. We should have sent that out, but we didn't, but we, we have the numbers. Yeah. I think the, the state data is from 2022 and the 2023 data comes out in January yeah. or like later this month, but we can, we, but we can get to the 2022. Yeah. And so what we're talking about is what percentage of the uh, tax paying public in Montpelier is, uh, participating in the income sensitivity program, right? That's what your question is, right? Yeah, which gives, you know, tax relief to people on, you know, up to something like close to $130,000 of household income. Everyone below that is getting kind of the lowest um, income folks get up to, I think, $8,000 off their property taxes, and then it ratchets down the higher your income goes. But that's a big factor when we're thinking about the impacts of any property tax increase of who is it impacting and how. And we talked about the equity screen a couple of weeks ago. So we we're talking about cutting services for lower income people. Like it's just a, an important factor to keep in mind too, you know? So yeah, I just, I'm very curious. How many yeah. people are benefiting from that in the community or not? And, you know, just kind of how that plays out for community members. Right. I think it's in the 50 to 50 to 60% range. Um, but when we pull that, I'll give you the exact number, but I, I recall it being in the 50 to 60% range. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Tim, I'm sure you have this experience more than I do, but I'm regularly, when someone is from talking about moving to Montpelier from out of state, and they look at the uh, the listing cards on the multi list and or or Zillow or whatever, and, and it says the property tax for this house is whatever, and it's some number. And I always have to say, well, it's not necessarily what you pay. It's complicated. It's the answer is complicated. Yeah, uh, Donna. Well, and, and along with that question, I I'd like to see what are the other percentages if we could for other towns like Barry um just to have some ideas of what that rate is and how how we compare but i also wanted to just advocate for putting back the money for my ride it's again it's those people who need it the most that i feel we we can't we shouldn't cut uh, so i would like to restore that 40,000 for my ride Tim. Yeah, a couple of thoughts. I think on the income sensitivity piece, it is important and it helps a lot of people. And I think on the other side of the coin, as we work through budgets, it also, I think you get a lot of folks who feel like maybe the budgets as proposed don't affect them as much and they're a little bit disincentivized to, to look at the numbers and make a decision about what it really costs because they feel like they're really not paying that bill. Um, so I think it's had kind of an interesting impact on our budgets and and how they're passed. Um, so I'd be careful with that number. And and in terms of the my ride piece, Donna, I think at least where I'm at in this process, and I'm new at it. So it, thinking, I'd love to get through this and get a sense of of everything before we start just adding pieces back in. Um, I see, hopefully, we can do that more toward the end. Um, my take, as I said last time, is I'd really rather see us, and which is what we've done tonight, is focus on on the key areas that are our responsibilities, the police, the fire, the EMTs, the public works, and, and make sure we're handling and funding these departments properly to provide the services that benefit everyone uh, a lot and their critical services. And then after that, I'm, I'm really not looking to raise the taxes. I, I'm looking at once we fund our key services, we will want to look at some of these other departments and make some cuts. I think we need to. Uh, the budget that's proposed that it's 3.2% is what it's billed as. We already know with the with the um, tax appeals and the potential tax abatements, it's it's more like a five point something percent increase on our side. Um, and we still don't know what the schools are doing. So I, I think we need to work through our key services uh, still before we start adding in other items. So Tim, when you say you'd like to have a look at the whole picture, is there something that you think we don't have a view of yet that you want to get uh, that you have answers that you want to have or questions you want to have answered? 
I mean, looking at public works, you know, we've heard a lot about deferred infrastructure that we need to work on. There's a, apparently what about a thirteen million dollar estimate for current water lines. Um, Kurt mentioned roughly ten years to do that seems reasonable. I think is what I heard tonight. You know, that's a million three to a million five a year in current dollars. It needs to be in here somewhere uh, if we're going to tackle this. So just yes, and those would be in the water. The, this is really the general fund. Those are all funded through the water and sewer fund, so they aren't really part of this. So just I know, but our job is to get the big no, I, I get that. You could break it up twenty ways to Sunday, but nope. I want to get it. I agree. With it works. I, I'm just saying that 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 regardless of what it is, it wouldn't affect the tax dollars. It would affect the municipal and, and we're, that's coming. We will have that shortly. That's I'm not understanding why it doesn't affect the tax dollars. Because it's paid out of the water and sewer rates. Okay. Uh, I guess I'm just a poor taxpayer who just writes the checks, but no, no, you know, no, I'm trying no, to... I mean, I just, it's so that it, it would, I mean, yes, it all comes out of the same pocket. No yes, question it about it. Okay. No question about that, but it's not the general fund that we're talking about now. So, let me back up a little bit. Um, one of the reasons we emphasize the general fund at this time of year is that's the one that the voters vote on in March. Yeah. So that's the one we have to have done by the end of January. We have more time to do water and sewer to look at and go in more detail because you set that budget and you set those rates. Yeah. So we by necessary, nece you know, we sort of have to move the, the tax budget along. Absolutely, we should be understanding all of it. And all I'm saying is, you could add a million dollars in water line improvements and it wouldn't change the tax, the property tax rate. It would change the water and sewer rates. Right. And you'd have to look at those in those contexts. So unless it's shifting money between the two funds that. I understand what you're saying. I, I really feel like I need to do this all at once. Well, I, I, yeah. If we have a structure that's going to spread this out and have it connected, I think we've got a flawed structure. Yeah. I, no, I'm not arguing. I just want to make sure. For you and for everybody, I'm just trying to make sure my experience. Yeah. I, this is not making yeah. sense. Well, I want to make sure for you and for everyone who's listening. That's all that yeah. that they are different funds, but it's all part of the same operation and does all come from the same people, right. just in different ways. Mm -hmm. And and like yeah, so that. And, and one example of those different ways, one of the is that uh, we have the uh, payment in lieu of taxes program. That's mm -hmm. We get money from the tax from the state, which is essentially the same rate as they would if they were a private property owner. Um, but for the water fund, they're just a customer of the water service. And we get funds from Berlin. We have Berlin customers. So we get, mm -hmm. you know, the hospital and you know, the whole Barry Road, Road yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So there, there are, it, it's a, it is different sources. Mm -hmm. It is slightly different pockets. And there are part, members people in very few but there's some people in the community not on the water system that, yeah that have wells you know yeah. so. um donna uh, uh, thank you and i, I just want to mention one thing tim i i brought up the bus because as much as i'm going to try to make all the budgets meeting where i'm here now in ohio i'm not sure i will and i just want to keep it forefront of people uh, and that, and also that explains why I didn't want to support the forty thousand for the cemetery. I want it for the bus for the transportation. Uh, the other thing is, in my ten years on the city council, when I joined, our street money, our capital improvement money, was so far behind because the previous councils wanted to keep taxes low. And it isn't that I don't want to keep taxes low, but it's not responsible to to have our budget cut that we're not doing what we need to do. And I've been lucky to be part of some of the personnel studies that have happened in the past. And I feel we really are the right size of people. And when we went through the pandemic and we had lots of people furloughed, I missed them. The departments missed them. The public missed them. So I, I'm, I'm not looking at cutting staff beyond what's already been offered. Um, and I, I do think that it's important that we not cut the city budget so hard and then the taxes are going to go way up because of other items on the budget budget uh, on the ballot that the voters are going to vote so i want the right size city council budget but i don't want us to overcut ourselves that we actually diminish our services 
when we're going to have other items on the ballot that may very well pass and raise taxes up there anyway. So, um, thinking Thank about you. thinking about what we what I've heard tonight. For one thing, that's that's thanks, Donna. That's part of why I I mentioned at the very beginning of the meeting that if we look at where the jobs are. Once we get past fire, police, and public works, that's 70% of the jobs of 70% of the city employees. So if we look at every other department, I, I don't feel that we're uh, overstaffed. I don't feel that we're, we have a huge and unjustified um city government but you know we we can talk about that and tim as you as you have uh proposals you will certainly take that up like like every other proposal what i've heard tonight so far is i've only heard i think three proposals for increases or add-ins in the uh in the budget i've heard some support for Adding a police officer, which is one hundred twenty-five thousand, heard support for adding a firefighter, which is eighty-eight thousand, and I've heard support for or a suggestion for adding my ride back at forty thousand, and I have not heard. And so I'm curious about whether there are other areas that people think we should be looking to uh, to add money. And of course, then the question is, do we get it from? other cuts? Do we get it from uh, from revenues or what? So. Um, you know, my main concern is um, I, I don't think it, I mean, our, our, if we increase our budget and um, it's the smallest increase people are, are going to see in their in the in the tax structure, I, I don't know what the school is going to do, but it's going to be a, a pretty big whack, I think. And uh, sitting on the BCA and going through the uh, appeals for the reassessment, a lot of people have already been whacked by by that by the increase in the value of their property. So happening all at once, now comes the municipal budget. It just seems like. We have to, we, I mean, I think, I think the staff's done a, a I, I had high hopes of, of, you know, wrangling some cuts out of overtime or something that, you know, I didn't fully understand, but it looks like the staff's done a pretty good job of, of, you know, finding this, you know, this base budget to work with, but it's, Sarah, could you, um, I think last meeting you, you predicted what uh, you estimated not predicted what the uh, change would actually be. I mean, the budget's at 3.1 to 3.2%, but it doesn't include national life uh, assessment or appeal, and it doesn't include abatements, and there's and it doesn't include, well, the legislation that was proposed today, which right. would which would rebate what? The school portion or the, yeah, if, if it passes? I think that's right, I have. Yeah. Uh, could you what you could you give us again what you have? Uh... Yeah. Um, so after the BCA adjustments um, per the last council meeting that dropped the grand list down. And what that does is that right now, as the budget sits, there's a three point two percent tax revenue increase. But with the reduction in the grand list, that equates to a three point seven nine percent tax rate increase over the prior year. Um, and that does not account for national life um, going further than they've already gone or, or, or other related items, reductions or new ads to the grand list. And it doesn't include abatements. Correct. Right. Because we haven't gotten there yet. We start. Next week. Well, and that that will hit in this year, um, at which we have a deficit mitigation plan for. Um, it, okay. It's possible that they could also hit in next year. Um, people can ask at any time for that. So it, it it depends, and there's a lot of unknowns. So if if we see that crop up, we will then have to do additional um, cost saving measures to make sure we can accommodate for that. But but it's but what we know where we stand now from 
the actions taken by the Board of Civil Authority is 3.79%, not 5%. Correct. The the tax rate increase after I lowered based on the decisions made um, as of the last meeting, um, the tax rate would increase three point nine or three point seven nine percent at the budget you've been um, provided. Okay, thank but, you. But but national life is likely to to affect fiscal twenty five, right? Because they'll go through a process. It yeah. really it'll it'll either settle or. Uh, whenever that shakes out, um, there will be a, a repayment um, that is owed to them if it's less than what the Board of Civil Authority agreed to. And so that will have to be paid back. Mm -hmm. um, so we just need to be cautious of that as well. But of course, we don't know what's going to happen. Correct. You know, they, they, they can challenge what the Board of Civil Authority did, and they they can win, they can lose, or we can wind up somewhere in the middle. I was able to find the income sensitivity data um, on the Vermont Department of Taxes website. Um, they actually just have, I think, released the 23-24 um, property tax credits by um, town. It's a 14-page document, so you can see the counties and the towns. Um, for the city of Montpelier, we are, sorry, I just had it here. We have 1,894 um, homesteads, and of those 1,212 um, receive income sensitivity payments in a range of amounts, and so that's about 64%. So I was off in my percentages. Correct. <laughs> really tiny. <laughs> the nope. average education credit is one thousand five hundred and eighteen, and the average municipal credit is three hundred and thirteen. That's helpful. Great, thanks. Uh, Donna, I just would like her to to re say those numbers. It was a thousand and how many households? Twenty. Uh, there are uh, one thousand eight hundred and ninety four homesteads filed in the city of Montpelier, and of those, one thousand two hundred and twelve receive income sensitivity payments. Um, and then they break out what portion of that income sensitivity is education tax versus municipal. And they're typically weighted more towards ed, but that's $1,518. And the municipal portion is $313. Okay, thank you very much. As I recall, Sarah, there's also a total amount of credits for the community. I think it's when you see yeah. the total amount of money yeah. that comes into the community, it's also helpful. Yeah. The total amount of income sensitivity payments received by the city of Montpelier is two million two hundred and sixty two thousand one hundred and eighty dollars. Thanks. And could you email this yeah. to us and put it on put it on the budget section of the web page? Absolutely. Great. Thanks. Um, Lauren. Thanks. Yeah, just a few thoughts. I think the way I'm currently thinking about the budget, I mean, I've repeated it numerous times. Like my hope is that any positions that are being cut because of the budget crisis we're in, that we're not eliminating them, that we're maintaining the hiring freeze on them, if that's the situation, or we're kind of considering it in a hiring freeze pending as we go fight up the hill for some state dollars. Um, if more resources come in um, and I pledge myself to go up there and lobby for those. Um, so, and, and, you know, maybe I had brought up last time, you know, maybe it's like we start them partway through the year or there's, there's ways that we, you know, we look at a, a January 1st hiring date or something so that it's a less of a hit to the, you know, FY25 budget, but that has us on track to bring those um, resources back to the department. So maybe we can think a little creatively, save some money given, um, you know, how challenging this budget is. Uh, so I'd be interested in if there's anything the staff could come up with that would be like a reasonable plan um, to 
to get us there. Um, you know, I'm definitely hearing everyone wants to be fully staffing, certainly police, fire, and DPW, I think. Um, so that's, that's one thought. And I mean, I would extend the idea of kind of the goal to be re rehiring in the parks department and, you know, the other cuts too. Like, I, I just want them to be seen for me. I, I think that they are temporary cuts because we're in a budget crisis following, you know, this devastating event in our community. They're not long-term cuts, um, that I want to support. <laughs> um, the one other thought, um, that I brought up a couple weeks ago, um, I would love to see something like 25,000 put in for city committee funds, something that if there's an opportunity to go after a grant and we need some kind of city match, or there's a, you know, really timely project and that would come back to council and we could approve if those funds get used. Um, but just kind of zeroing out a whole bunch of our committees that are going to really make that work really difficult to do. I think having some opportunity to seize onto opportunities, um, over the course of that year would be really beneficial. Okay, thanks. Kurt, I, I realized as I say you come up and I realized that we didn't get from you a figure for what it would cost to add that uh, position back in. That's also 88,000. Yeah, that's also 88,000. Okay. okay. <laughs> Still your but that's not what you were coming up to say. Uh, no, um, I wanted to uh, make two points. One, um, to what Lauren just mentioned about ways to offset positions, particularly in DPW. Um, I talked a little bit about the MRGP grant or the Municipal Roads General Permit and the grant associated with that. Right now we have in the budget um, half of that available grant. Um, just based on staffing, we don't know that we could do the in-kind match to do the, all the work, um, you know. I would be willing to commit from DPW to um, to do all of the match to get that grant to reduce the cost of that employee. Um, obviously, we do not, you know, I don't want to lose a staff member. It is it does impact CIP, and so that's I think um, twenty or forty thousand dollars of can't remember the exact number, but I could get that for you next meeting. The half we put in was twenty three thousand dollars. So another twenty three thousand off that okay. eighty eight is potential. Uh, the second point I wanted to make um, with uh, regard to Tim's concerns about the, um, you know, not including the water um, and sewer rates in this discussion, um, I was just emailing with our consultant and um, <clears throat> going to really try to get that ready for the next meeting, uh, the priority list and where we're heading and what the um, schedule is for water line replacement. Um, so I'm going to do, do my absolute best to have that ready by the 10th. If not, then certainly by the 24th. Um, but I will definitely target for the next meeting just so we can kind of look at the, the whole big picture. Now, Sarah, just to, since you've got the live, uh, live thing on there, if we were to say, let's put back in everything that's been suggested here as a, as an add-in. So police officer, firefighter, DPW, my ride, and $25,000 committee funds. Um, that would add 2.76 cents to the tax rate, and it would make the tax rate increase be 6.99% uh, over 24. It seems like kind of a lot. Mm -hmm. Yep. With the, BCA. with the BCA, but without the unknown national land. Lauren. Just to remind me, sorry, I know it, it asked the, the previous meeting and I just can't remember the answer. Does this assume that we are getting that um, the bill that was introduced for the education tax refund, which seems very likely that we will. So, I mean, I'm just like some of these, if, if we do, what would we fund with that is how I would like to. <laughs> so we have to pay the education tax anyway. So getting that so refund back from the state is reimbursing us for fronting the school. Um, we're still. So there's no. 
it, it, it could be a net loss, but there's no. That would be in this current statement. fiscal year. Right, that would that, be in this, in this budget. This is the happening right now. Okay. If we and that's we have right. to pay the ed fund, that would reimburse us. Okay, so that's not impacting this. That's part of the one point five million yeah, dollar current you. budget. I keep it's hoping it's going to be like some money for us, and I keep getting the answer I don't want. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No, we don't. But but yeah. the bill that's introduced is to help offset this, because if we abate the taxes, we're still on the hook for the full education tax. So the municipal taxpayers have to pay the ed portion of all those abated taxes. And doesn't come out of the school budget; it comes out of the municipal budget. So, this bill would help offset those education reimbursements that municipal governments have to make. But we don't know to what extent, and will it pass? I mean, I think it will pass, but who knows? And uh, so, no, we have not assumed any money at all. But again, that would be in the current. Most like, I mean, as Sarah said, there could be abatement requests next year too, but. Um, it, they're likelier to be for this fiscal year, so we would it would help help us not reach 1.5 million. And actually, no, I know, that was on top of that. Right, the education there. portion was not included in the 1.5 million right. deficit mitigation plan. Uh, yeah. That's in addition. So that's another whole chunk of change. Yeah, and and I just noticed as I was going over the bill last night that it's it's drafted right now with an effective date of July one, and. Uh, we could probably, as it goes through the committee process, it might be that the section on education uh, <clears throat> reimbursement would have uh, effective on passage or something so that it could come in the current fiscal year. Uh, Donna. Uh, thank you. I wanted to go back to the added police and FAR. Uh, part of what I thought I heard Lauren say, and maybe Carrie did too, was to have the 16 in the budget this year with the intention of the 17th coming back if we get additional funding versus putting those back in full till. Uh, no, you're, you're not wrong. That's that's definitely what uh, Lauren said. And I I don't have a concrete proposal. Okay. But I was just saying, well, let's just. Yeah, see what it costs. Let's just play what if, you know. There, you that's see, just too much. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Scary. Sarah, how did how did you do that little bit of math that you just did? I mean, is that the tool that? Yeah, the... so that that tool was sent out to you. Um, I made adjustments to it in advance of this meeting so that I could give you percentages quicker. Okay. And so my plan is to put that um, the updated version on the website and to send that out to all of you oh, again. Okay, yeah, because I have that link. I think Kelly tonight. sent me a version. Is that do I have the updated version? No, no. Okay. And so the updated version will go on the uh, on the city's webpage. Yes. And what that means is that anyone out there in taxpayer land or in Zoom land can can do the same thing. They can go through the budget and uh, and say, well, what changes can be made, and what impact will that have on the total bottom line and on the property tax rate? It's a very cool thing. Yes, Bellin talking about increasing uh, the tax rate uh how much we can um how much support we can provide through city revenues if we added these things to the budget revenues city revenues or we we are not planning to use any of the revenues so we for the budget just the tax thing well we've already made our estimate or what kind of external revenues. So um, whether it's state funds or rooms, meals, alcohol tax, those types of revenue. We've already, our, this budget is based on our conservative estimate of what we think those revenues would be. So at this point, any additions to the budget or deletions would be really coming from the tax rate, unless you all wanted to up the revenue estimates based on you know, knowing something that we don't know. But um that whatever we want to add to the budget will affect the tax rate. We cannot use any city revenues because- That's correct. Would be a possible exception of like, for example, Kurt just mentioned, if there was an additional person, we might be able to get some additional revenue. So instead of it being a, a net 88,000, it might be a net 50 some odd thousand. But that's a 
that's kind of rare. We don't think there's other dependent revenues on specific expenses um, that I'm aware of. Seems like we've got to find something, I, at least for me to be, I'm not comfortable with this. And and even if, if we started out roughly 3% and it's creeping up to 3.9 or 7.9 or whatever, it's going to keep going at this rate because there's some big unknowns. I mean, how do we find, I guess I'm trying to find where we can look for the changes. I mean, if we go back and say, Bill, okay, we want to hold it more 3 3.2 where we started, what would be the next level of adjustments? Is that... I just don't feel like I know the internal workings of this well enough to. Do well, that. Um, I'm not sure how to answer that question. We, well, one thing we know is that uh, the majority of our uh, budget is personnel. That's right. And so cutting the way when, uh, the budget as proposed saves money. It saves money by cutting positions. Yes, mostly. I understand. And so, others. Yeah. But, but our role is to provide the services and, and our job is to determine how can we provide those services. It's not to be a full employment agency. No, right? I agree. So totally. really it's our we're responsible to at least review this and look at it and say, why do we have five people in the city manager's office? You know, or why do we have how does community justice fund or, you know, whatever the questions are, um, th th those are pieces we really need to be yeah. working through. Fair dance. It, it, sure. If you want to talk about any of those, we're happy to talk. I do. Yeah. Yes. So community justice, hundred percent state funded. That's, so that's really not worth. Right. That's that's easy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and city manager's office is uh, the same three people that we've had mm -hmm. since I began here, uh, which is, you know, was once a time with Sandy and Bev and me, and now is Mary and Kelly and me. And then we've added uh, Evelyn's communications position and Chris's uh, sustainability and, and um, a facilities coordinator position, which were basically based on council priorities and requesting funding. So those are those are the five that we have instead of the three over, um, to address specific needs. And um, th so th those are changes in recent years that have been made. Uh, otherwise, there's really in, in the major change, I think, otherwise in the city manager's budget was, again, much like with overtime and other departments, we'd been sort of underfunding legal thinking this is the year we'll get by without spending as, you know, oh, yeah, our lawsuits are biased. And so we finally up the legal to match our spending trend. Um, so that's so I mean, really, there's no other change in our offices than those. Assistant city manager since you got here, right? No. That was long before you got here? Uh, well, so when I got here, Mike Jones served as the assistant city manager yeah, the city assessor. and the assessor. And yeah. then Bev became, kind of part -time. Bev was the assistant manager really from the whole time I was here. I mean, that was her job title. And so then we've replaced her with Jesse and then Sue and Cameron yeah. and now Kelly. I mean, it's it's not a new position. It's 29 years old at least, really if, 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 if not longer and then uh, so the only new like i said um the the sustainability position the communications position renews to address specific issues and um so certainly those are new and uh expanded areas of service and um i don't know what we would have done without either of them in the flooding scenario um they were both were very critical in terms of even now putting back our communicating with the residents about what's going on and putting back what we're doing but you know, we need everything. So I, I, I hear you, but the, so I'm happy to answer those questions. Like I said, CJC is hundred percent state funded. It's fully granted. Um, our only contribution basically is providing them space and uh, that kind of thing. And, and they actually provide services to our, our own city services and, and they do some extra things for Montpelier residents that they don't do for other places in return for that mediation services and those kind of things. So, and they do great work in the community. Yeah. But we're happy. To, I mean, we're happy to talk about the finance department. Or, clerk, well, clerk's not here, but clerk treasurer's clerk, and the, and uh, I don't know anybody else. I mean, the assessing office, you know, was a full time person and two full time people. Now Jane is part time, and and Marty's a contractor. Mm -hmm. So that has not grown at all. 
Um, and obviously assessing is something we have to do. Uh, clerk is two people and finances hasn't really changed. Yeah. I mean, those are, so, you know, we, we can go through what everybody does happy to, um, but, but in terms of changes, they really, I, I know I hear that too, you know, it's all these people, but it really, you know, some of their, you know, I think I, yeah. So maybe their titles have changed, but their jobs haven't. Yeah. That's right. Um, it's just frustrating because it's the classic, it almost feels like, okay, these are all the good reasons we can't change anything, but I think we just have to look at the options I'm and not, understand. I, I, I'm, I, I'm not so arguing why we can't change anything. I'm, I'm just, so I guess the question is what to ask you to, do. you know, I, so, I mean, ultimately you have to set the priorities. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously I, I wouldn't expect that you would go into detail and make changes to the budget, but you can say we want to hit a certain level and these are the things we prioritize. And, you know, if, if certain priorities aren't as important as they were, tell us that. And if some departments or operations aren't as important as others, tell us that. Or if you think they're important enough to continue, you know, we, we based our budget presentation seeing on the needs that we have and the services we're providing to the residents and made our best, you know. Yes. When, we, when, when, when it's left, yeah, right. So you, sometimes we get a lot of guidance in advance of the budget about where priorities are and what level you want to get. And sometimes we don't. Mm -hmm. And we didn't, you know, you, given the fact that there's a lot of not new people, we were kind of left to our own devices. So we, on our own, chose to bring it in at the inflation rate, not knowing what BCA was going to do, and to to recommend the array of services and costs that are in there. Um, and now it's your job to say, well, did we get it right or wrong, and how do you want to change it, and where are the priorities? And you can send us back, but you need to give us – at this point, if you just send us back, we're not, we don't have any more information than we had before. So if you send us back to do some work, please tell us where your priorities are and we can try to meet them. But we can't we can't operate in a vacuum. This is this is the budget's been plopped on your desks and now it's up to you to decide what you want to do with it. I mean, not tonight, but Lauren. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, I just again have I think a different philosophy than Tim on some of this. And part of it is just having now been one of the longer serving members and hearing over and over again from the departments, like there's not a lot of that to trim from the departments. Consistently, we hear a need for better services, better infrastructure. And to me, that doesn't scream. We're a bloated bureaucracy that needs a lot of cuts. It's we need to strategically invest I fear that this budget is already erring towards being irresponsible in ways that is going to cost taxpayers more money over the next decade. Things like we're deferring a bunch of equipment purchases that they might break this year and we're going to spend more fixing it and then buying a new one. And so I just, I think we're already like at that really slim budget that, I mean, I, I'm uncomfortable. It's, too low, even though I'm also really concerned about the tax rate, you know, and that this is like, as we keep talking about, but I mean, I, I certainly would not support going any lower than this and adding a little bit in to just make sure that we're not missing opportunities and um, figuring out some way to be building to get the staffing back specifically, you know, for the emergency services and things to the levels that seem like are better serving our community. That's, that's my current approach. It, it seems like there are some questions that are not all the questions are or unknowns are bad. <laughs> and I think it's worth keeping that in mind. You know, obviously we don't know what's going to happen with the, uh, with the abatements. We don't know what's going to happen with the, some of the appeals of, of the assessments. On the other hand, we don't know what the, um, rooms, meals, and alcohol tax is going to be for uh, for the next year. That's not, we're talking not starting until 
July, we don't know what uh, what the revenues are going to be. And as we see restaurants starting starting to open again, we can anticipate an increase in that. I assume some of that is built into the assumptions, but. Um, so I, I have reduced local options tax revenue from how we have historically budgeted it, given all of the unknowns, um, and that there's no real way to to data mine. It's kind of the Vermont Tax Department's secret. You know, that's just not data they share. So there's no way for me to analyze to determine what is happening now and what will happen. So I think, well, it's a conservative approach. And if revenues return, that's great. And we can revisit how to use those. But I think the budget that's sitting in there now is is the best guess at what it could look like in 25. Now, one of the things that the state legislature used to do, and I don't know if they still do it anymore, is they used to have this thing called the waterfall. Remember that? Uh, do they still do that? I don't think they do. Where uh, if if there's more if there's more money, they can specify well what comes next, what the next expenditures are with that additional revenue, and that's kind of what Lauren was talking about with the uh, with the police and fire department. You know that maybe we don't have enough money to fund those positions now, but six months into the year, we don't know where we're going to be, and so I don't know if we need to formally do that um and that's a question for you bill if we if we if we adopt a budget of a certain amount and then it turns out that our revenues are above what uh, what we budgeted for how do we manage that um so i will answer that question hopefully succinctly but i'll also observe that six six months into the fiscal year next year would be right now so we are six months into the current year. So you will be sitting here doing the budget and we'll have a sense of how that that current year is going and you'll be able to make those decisions. So the the vote, and this is why this is why it is different than the, the other budgets. The vote that takes place in March sets the amount of the voters approve the amount of tax dollars to be raised. And that and we then set a tax rate against the grand list. The city council, so the, the budget, is, you know, we the budget explains that, but the city council can, as you know, we get grants, we get different things, or like this year, we had revenue short for us. We actually had to reduce the budget. It didn't change the tax dollars to be, well, other than the fact that we expected some of them to be lower. Um, so, so you can't change that tax dollar number, but if we suddenly were $500,000 ahead, you know, you would have the option to consider if you wanted to spend that, if you thought it was sustainable, um, you know, going forward, if it was, I, I wouldn't, you know, or, or is it a one-time thing? And so we only want to spend it on one project or something. You have that flexibility at any time. And in fact, when we, as we manage the budget throughout the year, we do that all the time. I mean, mm -hmm. if a bad winter and something goes up, we try to offset it somewhere else. And, um, and that's even our departments have struggled with that sometimes because they're like, Hey, we're under budget. And we're like, you still can't spend it because another budget, you know, went over it's, it's we're looking at the whole, whole thing. And, um, well, so, so yes, you have that flexibility and you don't necessarily have to vote it. You can decide it at any given time or we can come and propose it. Um, what you what you set for the tax dollars is really that's what it is all it's saying to voters this is how much and and obviously there's a good faith promise there when you say here's all the things we've included and haven't included that that we'll do those you don't get to you know vote the tax dollars and suddenly change the priorities all around i think that i mean you probably legally could but i wouldn't advise it <laughs> Um, Helen. So not having that much alternative, right? Because I don't want to have any tax increase, but city doesn't have that much revenue to help that we want 
to see in the uh, primary services like fire, police, and uh, public works, then that's our only chance as a city council to have a te tax increase. So, or reduction somewhere else. But then, as yeah, we I mean, talk, those, there's those no, are your choices. Yeah, but we try, right? And there's no place to reduce anything. So it is really I. So it is great all these discussions, but if we will be end up the place we have started, like okay, we need to have tax increase. Then I feel a little bit. I don't want to say this, but just like I was like, yeah, not powerless, but no option, right? What 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 do you want to do now as a city council? Because all the things we are trying to see in the budget will lead something that we don't want. Let me talk for myself. I don't want like tax increase. And like we are talking about room or like service tax or like other things as a city revenue. Uh, and we said, oh, maybe businesses cannot do this. Like maybe they will not reopen. But at the same time, re residents are the same situation, right? If we increase the tax, most of them cannot pay that one either. So I, again, maybe it's very re 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 you know general question. But w what is the solution? So should we just say, okay, we will go with the tax rate? Is it the easiest option to do? Because why are we discussing all these things? if it will take us to the tax increase in the well, end. You, what you, you said something that I'd like to explore a, a little bit, um, that you said you don't want to see a tax increase or a tax rate increase. Are, are you saying that your goal for the budget for next year would be to be a flat uh, tax rate without even the uh, rate of inflation increase that's been proposed to us? Um, option for the residents, right? That much tax increase. Right? We start with 3.1, right? Okay, yeah, good. It sounds good then. As you ask, oh, could you please add this, Sarah? Then like, oh, it is like, no, it is three point something. I'm talking about that increase. So, okay, gotcha. So, it, all the residents we talk about like what 64 percent like income sensitivity you know it is a lot right so if we are if our only solution to have a tax increase then most of the people even if they vote this budget uh on march they will uh affected by it negatively so I'm just trying to uh, understand our options. We don't have any revenues that can help us. We cannot make more cuts because there's no way to do this. <laughs> it is really difficult, like for all of us, not only city council, but for city staff too. So it is very, very difficult situation. Well, let me so jump in before yeah. you do, uh, Bill. You know, you're saying there's no way to make cuts. Tim has been saying he doesn't believe there's no way to make cuts, that he thinks the, we can find cuts. And uh, and so that's not quite the same, but we, my perspective is that we provide a whole bundle of services for, this, for the voters, for the residents of Montpelier. And uh, everything that we've put in the budget for all the years that I've been on the council and for many years before that have been services that have really been important to the city and, uh, and people have, uh, have supported them even when there it's resulted in, uh, in tax increases. But if, if you or Tim or anyone wants to make an argument that we want to cut the, uh, cut the size of city government and that and save money by doing that well then that's an argument to make and we've got two meetings coming up uh to make it and and 
the council will vote on whether whether we do that and then the voters will ultimately vote on uh, on what what they're willing to do so bill go yeah so i was going to say something similar which is that i mean just to be clear everything's a choice and um you know i when i talked to you all in march about the rules and i talked about you know the council sets the policy and we implement your policy or our job is to recommend a budget to you the biggest policy decision you make every year is basically how to spend other people's money you've heard me say that so this is what this is so you have the full range of choices if you wish to have no tax increase and it's what 360 some odd thousand dollars or something like that you could do that you would have to then decide which services we don't provide at the same level we provide. So what you've been hearing when you say we can't do this is if you want to continue providing police, fire, public works or anything else, similarly to what we're doing, we're, we're, you've been hearing from your folks what the impacts are. And so if you want to reduce those departments or any other department, because there's some you haven't heard from yet, um, that's a policy choice. So just like that list of things that we're not funding, whether it's, you know, the, the housing trust fund, all those things, you know, we're saying this isn't as important to us this year as doing something else. So, you know, it's your job as an elected group of officials to decide what's best for the community. What's the right mix of budget tax rate and services. And, you know, there's no right answer. If there's a right answer, we just calculate it and it would be done. It's a priority question. It's a, it's a policy, po small P political question. You know, I can't answer that for you. I get, I work for you. My job is to do what you want to do. My job was in our team's job is to give you our best proposal based on what we understood to be your priorities and what we understood to be your financial parameters. Now, so, and we can answer all the questions you want. If you want to take, if you want to know what it would cost, what it would do if we cut three police officers, the chief would tell you that. If you wanted to know what it would look like adding three, you know, that that's what we're here for. We're your resources. But at the end of the day, you get elected to decide what's the right mix of all of this for the community. So it's not that you can't do it. It's you've got to, you know, the majority of you have to choose to do. And that's how, how it goes. So, you know, and and our, we'll help you through the process any way we can, but I, I, I can't tell you what to do other than saying, you know, unless you give me more direction of where you will, you know, is it zero? Is it 5%? Is it 3.2 or 3.79? Or what is it? And where what what's important to you? And then we can help you get to where you want to go. It's like, remember the plane, right? What's your destination? Where do you want to go? How fast do you want to get there? How much do you want to spend to get? There? This is, do you want to take seven stops in the low budget way, or you know, do you want to have the nonstop jet? May I? Um, if, yeah. if it helps uh, to provide any perspective, um, the average residential property value is around three hundred and seventy thousand. The budget that was presented to you um, would be a hundred and twenty-one dollar tax increase um, for the year. And if you wanted to reduce the tax rate from the 3.79 back to the 3.2, that would be another 68,000 in cuts. And then back to a no tax rate increase would be an additional $368,000 worth of cuts. If that helps. So a little low, around 430,000 yep. to, to get, get to, to zero. zero. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tim. Well, what what I think it you know it's tough because we can make choices and they're tough choices and they're political choices and really it just feels like governing by choosing a percentage and, and it, it's it doesn't feel like the right way to do it but it looks like that's the way it's been done in the past and probably what we're going to do again. Um, I mean, last year it was a quick wham bam and you just approved what an eight point five percent I think is what it was. Um, unfortunately, I, I, and it didn't affect everyone the same way, I understand, but I, I look at the impact of that 
on our taxes. And it was not an 8.5% increase. It was a lot more. It was almost double that. And so that's why when I hear your your predictions, I'm a little skeptical. I'm just not sure how that all works out. I know it was a reassessment year. There was a lot of factors, but um, you know, we're really there's a lot of people impacted here that aren't paying the costs. And when they start to have to pay the costs, like our tenants, I mean, I haven't raised the rents to cover last year's increase. And I have to. I mean, it's just, I mean, just it's unbelievable the increase that was caused by last year's increase, and we're going to do it again. Um, and that's only taxes. It doesn't count water, sewer insurance and all the other things that are going up, as you know, from our budget. So I think we've got to look at this really hard and we've got to find a way to focus. But if you guys don't want it, I mean, it takes all of us to vote. If it's just me making noise and the rest of you are going to say, oh, what the heck, let's do 3.79 or whatever. And then we're going to see all the other impacts on top of that when national life prevails, um, if they do. And I think there's a chance. Um, and when we get through the other adjustments we're going to have to make for loss of use of properties because of the flood, you know, we still don't have any of the hotels in town up. The Capitol Plaza is still down. The Animal Pillar is not doing much. So I don't think you're going to see a lot of the revenues. Jack's hoping for that waterfall. Um, I don't think you're going to see it this year. So it's not realistic to plan for it. Um, we, I, I think we really need to find a way to break this out. And I, I can't do it tonight, but I'll well, try to be ready for the next one. Yeah, no one's saying you have to do it tonight. I, but is it just me or, or does the rest of you feel like there's any need for adjustments? Because if you don't. Well, well, what I, I'll, I'll get to you in a second. So what, what I would say, Tim, is that uh, I, I would caution it saying, at, at phrasing it as you're saying that you want to take a close look at what we do and the rest of the members of the council are just saying, oh, what the heck? I think every member of the council is taking a close look at what we do and taking a serious look at the services and uh, and the costs and making possibly making a different judgment than you about what's worth it. But I saying characterizing it, oh, what the heck, is like saying that other members of the council are really not... Uh, taking it seriously and really not doing their following meeting their obligation to to the voters to uh adding a lot of words to the chat but well i am but it's just very quiet and i'd love to have discussing this and get just find out what people think um uh -huh. and, and without that that was my conclusion okay yeah so so um I, I think we are all struggling with it and um i mean i know when i first saw the proposed budget um I was just struck by the fact that the the positions that were cut were in the you know the the three places where my constituents tell me they're most concerned about services. Um, you know, I would I, I would love to stay at three point one. Uh, I mean, I was hoping to get under three point one if we could. It looks like that's really really hard to do. But um, Bill, you were talking earlier about. You know, getting direction. I mean, if we had said three point one and don't cut from police, fire, or DPW, you would have done that, and we could still take a look at what that would mean, right? I would like to see that. Um, I, I don't. I don't know if that I would vote for for whatever those cuts would be. I don't know what they would be, but I would like to. I'd like to see them because I think others have expressed. A similar concern that we're we're making personnel cuts in in fundamental services that you know that residents are most concerned about. So I appreciate that. A um, couple of responses to that. Number one, um, though, first of all, they're not the only places we. There's a position cut in rec. There's a pretty substantial cut in parks. The whole summer staff. Mm -hmm. um, we, I think we cut back some summer staff at REC as well in addition to a full-time position. Um, we've still got more internal positions we're looking at. Um, so so they weren't the only ones. I want to say that, number one. Number two, um, many of the departments are very small. You know, you heard, heard the planning department. And um, so, a, a, you know, a, a one person cut to them is a 20% reduction as opposed to a, a much you know smaller reduction. And in, you know, planning, just 
picking on planning specifically, um, we knew we were cutting out all the funds, economic development funds and those kind of things. We wanted to keep the wherewithal to at least do stuff internally and like move the country club program, you know, other projects, other priorities that are still happening um, in, in the city. Then going specifically to the three departments, I agree, those are the top priority departments. In police, again, it wasn't so much a cut as we didn't add the 17th position. We were already at 16. So, and that's what we have in our current funding. So it was, we, sh you know, we would like to add the 17th position. We didn't do it. So, so that was one. And in DPW, they've been running short. They're currently running short too. And so it was like, well, if we can fill one of them, we're, we're better off than we are today. It's not ideal. The fire, it's a, it's a, it's a real reduction. And honestly, I think they're the ones of, those three, that's the one that will feel it the most out of those big three. Um, not that the others won't. I don't want to, you know, play favorites, but I think that's just the case. Um, so that that's how we got there. But it, you know, a lot of people were given at the office, and uh, it was how do we reach? And, and you know, to Tim's point, setting a percentage isn't necessarily the best way. But when you when you don't have anything else, I mean, if there's another way to, you know, if you want to just go through the budget and Decide where you want to, you know, one way is just go through every, you know, I, I'm not saying this, what the heck, but, you know, the other option is we come into you with the budget we had, which was, you know, with the extra million and a half and say, here's, here's, here it is fully loaded. Let's just go through what, it, what do you guys want to put in and out? And you have all that information. So you, you could put it all back in and start from scratch, or you could do whatever you want, or you could send us back to the drawing board. You know, there's no right way to do a budget other than the way that works for, you know, your group. And, you know, maybe another year we'll have a different conversation in September or October about how we want to do this. Um, so, you know, we're open to whatever we want to make where our job is to make this work for for you folks and for the community. And um, so that's, I, you know, I, I want to be clear that what it wasn't just, hey, let's take these positions because, and but and they weren't the only ones and so Terry, you've been kind of quiet for a while. Um yeah, so I'm I'm um I agree that coming up with a percentage and then trying to make your budget fit it is not a good way to do budgeting, but um but I think we're a little bit stuck with that. Um and I'm and I keep coming back to this idea that we have been hearing from the public and we have set in our own priorities that public safety, public works are are essential. And so I'm not comfortable with the cuts that are proposed to those. I would be much happier putting those back in. Um and and I and I would like to I would like to I would like to consider the possibility that we're going to have to have a higher tax increase than 3.2% in order to be able to provide the services that we want to provide. Um, I'm not close to that idea. And um, Sarah gave us a uh, sort of an estimate on what the increase on a tax bill would be for the 3.2%. I'd be interested to know what that would be for the six or whatever it was. Um, I think that would help give us a little bit more perspective. Uh, yeah, so the six, adding everything back in. The 6.99% would be a $223 uh, tax increase, which is 102 up from that previous amount. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That's helpful. Uh, and that, that includes my ride and the 25,000 um, that Lauren, so I can take those out and give you that oh, amount too. Okay. That was all of that. All right. Yeah, and those two are sixty-five thousand. So yeah, Ellen. So I know that uh, Bill mentioned this before, and I agree with him that um, the money FEMA uh, gave to us, we can't, we shouldn't put it in the budget. But can we use at least some of it for this year? Not the like, the budget items. It has to be there like forever, but just to give some relief is there i'm trying to find like um talk about different options you know we can say no we cannot do it it's okay 
it's just like, is there any way to use some uh, external money to create some kind of relief, at least for this year? Well, if we do that, the money's gone. Yeah, I know. It's like <laughs> That's the problem, right? Because it's a discussion. Yeah. So I think... Um, our plan was to have that on the agenda for the next week's meeting and with some, some suggestions, you know, recommendations, uh, and I think, yeah, let's just leave it at that. Cause I, I want to like to go through the options. There are some options. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm pretty sure what I'm going to recommend, but I will wait till I talk to the full staff, but, um. I'm. I think we ought to be quite careful. This is a one-time opportunity, and if we're going to move this project, anyway, we'll talk about that next week. So there we are. Um, go ahead, Ch Palin. Uh, for this discussion, I want to see um, fire public works and police department, these three positions to be added um, to the budget. And again, I, I don't want to see tax increase personally, but these are important uh, positions, so we need to have them. So that's my overall um, insight for the discussion for tonight. Okay. Thank you. So Sarah, if we... If we add those three positions, but not the other sixty-five thousand, what where does that put What's us? What's the total value of those two? Uh, three hundred one thousand of those three. Um, uh, DPW and fire are at eighty-eight thousand apiece, and um, the police is at one hundred and twenty-five, and that includes all benefits. And we um, budget for vacant positions or unknowns at a two-person plan, and and so it's a gamble as far as whether they come on with a family and it comes in higher, or they come in at single and it comes in lower. Mm -hmm. um, but so if we put those three in there, that's three hundred one thousand. That's a 6.42% tax rate increase, and the average bill would see $205 increased, um, which is 84 over the 3.79. Mm -hmm. okay. I don't know if there are other counselors who have ideas for other places to cut to compensate for that but this would be the time to bring those up. Nobody seems to want to. I, I, What about, Bill, at one point in the year, you threw out the idea. I know this will get people all excited because nobody comes out like the seniors when they want something. But I think the thought of having a co-director for the senior center and the rec from an administrative point of view um, makes sense. And there have been times in our past when it was that worked and the, the rec, director of the rec was not a full-time position and it was augmented with other responsibilities. So I, I think that could happen again. And maybe if that's a place we need to look for some potential savings and find a model that works for both departments, I think we can do it if people want to be positive and try to do it. It's one thought. That sounds like something to look into. <laughs> You kind of already have, so it shouldn't take a lot. You know, are there any other places where we've had structural change? I mean, because if we can find some structural change, that would help. You know, if we have a fire chief retiring um, and look at the structure there, do we need as many layers as we have? I mean, we have a fire chief, an assistant chief, six lieutenants, and, and, a, and a, we're not a huge fire department. Um, maybe if you promote a new chief and don't have an assistant chief and we work on, I don't know, are there, is there a way to look at your structure and uh, still make it work? So what are you thinking, Tim? Uh, cutting the number of uh, personnel? Of administrative cutting... personnel and trying to keep the, the firemen and the EMTs staffed, yes. Okay. And are there other places like that that we could at least consider? Um in other departments. I don't know. Well, yeah, I keep I keep coming back to and and you all have this information. I keep coming back to this uh listing 
of the uh, the organizational chart and the listing of uh, all the departments, and they're mostly really small. So, any cutting one position from any of those departments um, after after police, fire, and public works, the next biggest department is is finance, and that's six and three quarters. Um, and I don't know what what would happen with a cut of a position from finance. I'm currently operating with one vacant position. Um, and so we are uh, spreading the workload across um, everybody, but it's a difficult task and it it makes collecting payments in the clerk's office more difficult and processing the volume of payments and payroll and all of the things that we do and monitor. So um, I think we would figure out how to make it work um, if that was where we headed, but it wouldn't be ideal. Mm -hmm. So where we are right now is 5.75? Um, we have 6.75 in the budget. Um, I am at 5.75 gotcha. at the moment um, because I've been holding my position open to try to curb any kind of deficit we might see in 24. Yep. And that's actually a good point, which is some of the reason some of these positions are vacant is because we are trying to watch our spending in this current year. So even though they're in, in the budget, we are trying to save as much money everywhere we can um, because as you know we had a bad year last year and then we had flood and revenue issues so we are trying to sort of overcome all of that and we're on the heels of COVID so we've had a long run of bad financial standing so, so. Lauren yeah just I think just reiterating that, just, you know, having been here through crisis upon crisis and, you know, when people last year saw a big tax increase, it was compounding pressures from getting hit by COVID. State government is investing less in services that then are falling onto cities like homelessness. And all of a sudden we're sitting here and these are community members of ours that we have to figure out how to support in various ways. So we're getting these increased costs the same way the school districts are getting increased social service requirements on them. And I mean, I think there's like bigger structural issues. So it's a lot harder to look at our little budget and figure out, you know, what are big cuts to make then? And then, you know, the state budget's been doing that too, but the needs don't go away. They are falling onto us. And so it's just a really frustrating <laughs> position to be in and, you know, I, I, it's, it's so hard. It's putting us in this position where we don't want to make taxes untenable for our community members. And we have these urgent needs that the city provides. And so it's just, it's just to voice that frustration. <laughs> yep. Uh, Donna. Oh, th thank you. And going to Lauren's point. Uh, yes. I mean, for three years, we reduced budgets. So we wouldn't have a deficit. And taxes still went up because there were cost all around the pandemic and likewise with the flood. So I don't want to be too cut back, but I'm still going to advocate for keeping the 16 in the department, keeping that number we have now uh, once that Robert retires and that we, in our, at least our mindset and plans that if indeed we don't have another flood next summer or whatever, uh, that, we might be able to grow the both departments back up to 17, but I don't think this is the year to do it. Um, and I, I look at the seniors and they really, there really is um, a need for a, a senior expert. And if it's not the director, then somewhere in there, you've got to have someone who really knows about senior services. They are a different animal than the rec department. And so there's one thing about just an administrator, but within the programs within the senior center, I think it's real important that we have some staff that really has that really important expertise. So that's 
And so, Tom, Tim, and I think it does help to hear things. And, you know, maybe something someone will say next meeting and other things will click and we may all change some different position. So I, I felt every year this council has deliberated. It may not look like it from the publics, but that we studied and that we looked and we made a commitment to meet certain goals and we're willing to find the money, uh, to ask for the money to do it. Um, so uh, I think it's worth having more discussions. Thank you. Thanks, Donna. Tim. Just thinking of other ideas or places to just try to. So we've got the Elks Club. I mean, it's we saw the community survey. There's a fair number of responses that suggest we should sell it. Um, we'll talk about it next week, but it seems like that's a piece that it's not generating funds. It's a, it's losing at this point, right? It's got to be built. It's not making money. Well, we're. We're not collecting taxes on it. You've got buildings. You've had to deal with mold and remediation. Right. You well, haven't we, collected rent. Well, we can provide. We'll provide you the finances. Yeah. We, we, not, and when we, you do right. that, could you please give me that thing I asked for earlier, and you did once before, but update it with what we've got into it so far. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That would be great. Yep. So we got that fund. We've got yeah, the I mean, parking the building, fund loses the building money. Building expenses we, are covering we, themselves. We do. We are renting it. We're getting rent from the the shelter. But that just covers because you're paying the heat and all the yeah. So you really just it's a gift. It's no, a very I, nice thing to do, but you're not making money. No, but we're covering our costs. No, but I mean you said we were losing money. Well, you are because you're not really amortizing a mortgage. You're not collecting taxes, no, I understand that. and you've got costs yes. to maintain the building. You're losing money temporarily. Yes. Yes. And, and maybe you know I mean that's it's not me. It's all of us. <laughs> I know, but that's what I'm saying. Let's yeah. look for things yeah, that aren't that's fine. carrying the the water. Yeah. Um, the parking fund maybe is another thing to look at. Is there a way to restructure that? Um, where else are we losing money? Um, district heat? Yeah. A couple hundred thousand a year? I mean, if everything's on the table, we yeah. got to talk about this stuff. And we haven't. So what more do I have to do than bring it up? Do I need to come into the proposal for you? Or is... Uh Jack, I do. <laughs> I, I think you've identified some things that uh, you've asked the city manager to look at, and I think we can expect to see some data that can be inputs to the discussion at our next meeting. I mean, so yeah, to 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 your point, Tim. I mean, I can't tell you. We'll, we'll give you all the data about the Elks Club, and I think that's a you know that again that's a policy decision of the council is whether you know it was it was purchased with a long term vision and there's a plan and there's we can talk about that and people either want to see that through or not and that's a choice to make uh, and that would you know that would provide one time revenue wouldn't but uh, you know district heat again that's an operation of the city. Um, we can go through all the budget and the operation. I don't know what else. I mean, what we desperately, as you know, because you're a customer, we desperately need more customers. And we we are kicking every tire we can on that. Um, but, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't think we can't stop providing it. So. Um, yeah. Is there something we could do about that? Right. Bill? Other than well, I, we really need more customers is really what it comes down to. But um, so, so, you know, we can certainly go through. But it's a conversation, absolutely. But in terms of, and those are, you know, maybe bigger conversations. So, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I think you don't need to come up with a proposal from my perspective. I think other than saying, in addition to we have this, is like, what should we do about it? It's then what's the next step with it, right? So, you know, how can we, what, and we're happy to talk about any of it because, again, we want to do what you want to do. So, so thinking about that, since you brought up district heat, um, Bill, there's no way that we could just say, well, okay, we tried district heat. It was an experiment. We're not happy with the outcome. So we're dumping it. We can't do that, right? We can't do that until our contracts with our customers are up because um, they've, you know, they've invested in us and we've invested in them and um and i'd have to look at the state contract i think there might be an out after that so yeah. and we have debt that we have to pay off but the debt expires or was supposedly expires coincident with the contracts maybe not we'll look at that but yeah so no we can't just say this year we're not going to do district heat anymore and nor 
you know, again, there are people counting on that and including these buildings. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it would be a, it would be a long process to, to look at that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're not going to solve this problem tonight. Uh, Laura. Just, just very briefly. I mean, that's an example where part of Chris's job as our sustainable sustainability and facilities director is trying to finally have capacity to go and try to actually drum up business, which there hadn't been capacity to do before. I think, I mean, I think a spotlight on this and like what's happening and what's our more clear yeah. goals and targets. And like, yeah, like I, 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 I welcome that decision. And I think that's an example where we actually needed capacity and, um, you know, obviously he's gotten pulled into flood repair and all kinds of stuff in the in the interim. But um, yeah, I'd love to see us focus on how do we actually make this work. But I assume, and Bill, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that the in kind uh, work, like of having and transferring internal uh, city employees to doing flood relief. Is that something that we're filing a claim again with FEMA for? Is uh, that... Yeah, so the different categories of, of damage allow for different things. Um, and so for the emergency response period, we will be able to submit um, for overtime. Um, for debris pickup, we'll be able to submit for DPW's time doing that. Um, so each one kind of has a different um, threshold. So when we can recoup those costs, we will, and we are um, all tracking them to be sure. And at the very end, there's also an admin portion. So all of my time working on this and Kelly and everybody else's time um, were allocated a percentage and we can submit on that. So we've been tracking to try to recoup as much as possible. But a city employee who would have been on payroll anyway, and their function was just shifted from running the rec department or running the parks department to running uh, the hub. That's, that's just shifting. That's not a reimbursable claim. Correct. So during the emergency response period, uh, we all maneuvered to operate the best we could and fill in where we could. And, um, if that's budgeted payroll, which they all are, with the exception of um, some of the parks time that was in there, that their regular time will be reimbursable. The rest of it will not, just over time. Okay. Good to know. Is there anything else that we can fruitfully do tonight? Because I don't want to make people stay uh, beyond the point that we're accomplishing anything. We're going to call the school board and see how big their increase is. Well, I'm, I mean, if it's really 18% and we add six, talking about a 24, 25%. Well, it doesn't quite work that way, but it's high. Sixty percent and sixty percent of tax yeah. Right, it would be a blend. It would be yeah, 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 yeah. But Something still, it's a it. but it's a chunk it, of it's change. a lot anyway. It's a chunk of change. I, I like Sal's idea that I think we should meet with the school board, and it's it hasn't happened in a long time apparently. Tried it. Well, let's try it again, <laughs> and we can go meet them they don't have to come here but i think it's worthwhile to, to have some dialogue and conversation it, it, it's we're all one community and having these two ships sailing off in their own directions is not good there were there were a number if you if you all read the uh the the free comments to the survey there were the survey was about the city budget and there were a lot of comments that were saying we got to do something about school fed funding in, in one way or another. Um, and I think they they said that to us because we were the ones who were looking for input and they uh, they gave it. And I think not everybody understands the difference between city and school budgets, but and it comes out of people's pockets the same way. Lauren. Yeah, I, I do think we need to I mean, it's not going to be 18%. Like that was, yep. that's not real. So like, let's not scare people that that's a real number. Like that, that's not going to happen. Like, but, but we need to understand because I think there's, there's this year and there's a window where there's, 
like lowered impacts because of the way they wrote the state policy that's changing the formula. And then in a few years, it could it could jump really substantially. And like it does implicate because it's like we've been talking about it's the same people paying <laughs> paying these taxes. And so how is that going to impact what the city is going to be able to do? And how are we planning together? Or is there a state policy change that's needed or something that, um, you know, none of this is inevitable either. But I, I think, you know, and, and maybe there's a smaller conversation around the budget now, but I think like a, a bigger conversation in the future with the school board to understand what what's really happening here. What are the implications for our community and how do we together think about, I, I mean, I think that would be valuable because it is this changing landscape. It's really hard to understand from following just the media. <laughs> that reminds me, you actually harken back to something that Tim said earlier and, and I don't know why I didn't think of it when you said it then, but we were talking about the water and sewer rates. <laughs> along with everything else and you know i know you don't have the all the final budgets but our plan again subject to your review is that the water and sewer rates will be also be at the inflation rate plus the the, the council policy one percent now again you, you can change that plan but that that is current council policy until it changes and so that's the, and that one percent dedicated to infrastructure so that's what you could expect for there won't be anything it, extraordinary beyond those for either of those rates right so i should have thought of that when you mentioned it so and then kurt will we'll talk to you about the the plan for infrastructure um i just have so it it to where the mayor is into in terms of how we were going to move forward um so i got a couple questions we had we have a meeting next week, our regularly scheduled council meeting. So there will be a couple of other items on the agenda besides this, but again, primarily budget. Um, and then the 24th is kind of the last one um, because we run out of time. So we had put on the calendar, maybe a 17th meeting. It seems like maybe we need that. And one of the other things, but again, up to you, whether you want to have three more or two more discussions like this, but I think, uh, what we have done in the past, and I, I, my take is that we are nowhere close to being able to do this, is often going into the meeting next week, we would have a preliminary council budget for the for our first public hearing. And I, I, I don't think we're anywhere close to that. So one, so I guess we should decide how we want to proceed and whether you want, if you want to have a meeting on the 17th and if you want to have that as with a goal of next meeting setting at least a preliminary budget, knowing you have two meetings to change it. Because we typically have, we try to have two public hearings on the budget. They're not required, but we try to do it just because it's a good thing to do. Um, I do think we should do that. So that's, it's so. I, I think we should add a meeting to the seventh, on the 17th. I agree. Anybody say no? Unless you come up with a magic solution. Yes. Mm -hmm. Always better to cancel. Everybody likes to cancel a meeting that was already scheduled. So, okay, let's do that. Meeting, I know maybe it is not easy to do. Is there any way we can also add some item to discuss how we can make city revenues more than it is now? like to find other channels in addition all the things we have right so i know we are a small town our um options are limited but maybe we should brainstorm and find one or half extra you know way of uh creating some revenue for the city and some non-tax revenue you're talking about yeah yeah um and are you thinking about it for money that would start flowing in on July 1st of this year? Or are you thinking more long-term than that? Long-term, just like start the discussion because I think we have two options, right? Tax or revenue. So why can't we start discuss? Okay, can we find other revenue channels? If we cannot find, it's fine. But at least, you know, to brainstorm these things, um what i'm yeah. gonna say i'm gonna suggest if it is possible uh -huh. what i'm gonna suggest since we're you're not proposing this for the fiscal 2025 budget i'm gonna suggest we we do that but 
after we have we have enough hands are full enough dealing with the budget uh yeah i i don't think we can if we can make it for this year budget it's great that's what i am just asking is it possible to bill as i said the manager if it is not possible <laughs> to do this for this year yeah let's do it later uh, after the budget discussions but we should start somewhere right from somewhere yeah, so quickly on that, and I, I, for anybody interested in that topic, um, you might want to take a look at the revenue section in in the book to see exactly what we currently get for revenues. Um, you know, there are some things, you know, that we are legally allowed to have revenues for and some things that we're not. So fees for services, you know, we could increase permit fees. We could, you know, but those are also policy questions because then if we want, have encourage more housing and more development then you know is that you know but those are the kinds of things right so they're, they're all policy questions right they're all so fees for services um you know some i mean we are in we have ambulance fees but they are somewhat set by insurance companies and medicare and medicaid and those kind of things so we have limits there you know we can't just arbitrarily raise them um there are some of our fees come from, you know, a lot of our revenue comes from the state. So they decide how much highway aid we get. They decide, you know, how much pilot funding we get. There's so, so, so some of those are, you know, uh, state revenue programs. Um, you know, we have our local options tax that if there is one, and I am not proposing this this year, but there is one avenue there, the local sales tax that we have not taken advantage of. And, that requires a charter change. We'd have to have a ballot vote and go through the legislature. And um, that could bring in, I can't, I got the number wrong last year, so I don't want to, I, I, I'll wait until we have it right. But that, I mean, that's probably the biggest revenue chunk that's still on uh, the table that we haven't gone after, but it also, it, it's a sales tax. I mean, people are paying it and, you know, we, we talked about it a little internally with our team, whether we should, bring it up again this year. And our thought was, you know, downtown's been through enough. Um, it's not, you know, let's just get everybody back on their feet before we start talking about this. But th that is honestly, you know, we, over the years we've talked about, you know, payroll taxes and gas tax, and, you know, all of those have any, any kind of thing that we do has to be approved by the state legislature. So there's a pretty limited pool of what they will approve based on their history, which is not to say they would never do it, but, you know, if you, you're going to put a lot of time and effort into it, it needs that, that they're pretty clear what, and, and so otherwise it, it's really fees. So what do we charge for certain services? You know, I mean, do we want to start charging fees to everybody who has an event in Montpelier for police and fire costs? You know, on one hand, yes. On the other hand, councils in the past have said, we want a vibrant community. We, we like having these events. We're, we're happy to contribute the city's cost to helping make these things happen. You know, maybe that time has passed. So, I mean, there are some, but are those going to be, you know, a million dollars is going to drastically change the tax rate? No. Parking, parking fees. Parking fees. Do we want to raise parking rates? So... Del, did you have your hand up? Okay. Lauren. Just thinking of how next meeting can go. Um, I mean, I think potentially, so there's obviously the really good presentation we've gotten for kind of the city staff proposed budget. We tonight have identified a set of potential changes to that. And there's, I think, you know, so, so I'm assuming like you, you all will present, you know, council so far, this is what we've heard for some recommendations. Like my hope would be that we can all be as clear as possible before that meeting and come in. So, you know, if there's other ideas anyone has of what about this potential budget cut or that, like, however we can clearly convey so that that can be part of the presentation and we can start <laughs> focusing in on and making decisions. Obviously, we might have some other brilliant ideas as we all talk, but um, trying to be as clear as possible to present, like, this is kind of like the universe of um, ideas that have been put out that's finite and that we can start kind of talking, hashing through the implications of different decisions. Yeah. I, is that, as I assume how it will go? That, and I, I hope so. And I, I would encourage any member of the council who has a change they want to propose uh, up or down, 
if you can get it to uh, Bill to be to get a response and to work through the finances by Monday, that would be ideal. Uh, Friday would be even better, but it's already Wednesday night. Um, but yeah, and, and you know we have the tool set up so we can add, and you all have it too to to, to play with. But um, I think you know you're right. Having a list of sort of everything, every potential that you'd like to see added back, and every idea for reduction, and then at some point you you know what's the right mix, and we're you know maybe you know notwithstanding the argument that setting a, a, a limit is a good, but you know, where do you got to have some goal you're working toward uh, otherwise, or you could just vote. We want to make these cuts and these things and you end up where you end up. But you know, then you end, th then what happens is you put all, all in and all of a sudden then you're at 8%. You go, well, we don't want to be here. So it is good to have some sense of what you're, you can you can have a goal of where you're trying to get to, and then change that at the end when you see how far off you are from it. But it helps to be driving to a certain de destination. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we don't want to be at six point nine nine percent. I think uh, we probably don't want to be at six point four two percent. But uh, but I don't want us to be at zero percent either, because I think that that really cuts vital services. Um, I think we're done. I think that's the uh, conversation for tonight. Um, and so next up, we don't have any other business because we did the street closure under consent. City Council reports. Lauren. Really briefly, just reiterating um, event calling on the Postal Service to um, bring back a downtown post office Monday, January 8th, 1230 in front of the federal building. It would be great to get a crowd there. I think just showing that the community really cares about this uh, could be a powerful statement. Um, the Montpelier Commission for Recovery and Resilience uh, is holding a public uh, forum February 15th in the evening. So stay tuned on details for that. Uh, there was a great event that many of us were at today at the State House, um, really sharing a lot of the powerful stories of the impacts of the flood and calling on the state legislature to step up um, and the governor to to help communities like ours. So that was great to see, and hopefully some good things will come out of that. Um, some good legislation proposed by our representatives. Um, and the legislative committee, it would be great maybe Maybe we could meet at the state house in the cafeteria and uh, kind of hash out even just that like specific wish list that we need to go then mm -hmm. push on them to help us raise some revenue. Great. Another way we can raise revenue. Yeah. Get the state to step up. Oh. Thanks. Pass. Tim. Sal. Um, well, I was going to announce that I'm probably going to run again for this position, but it's so much fun. Maybe I should get somebody else a chance. <laughs> um, no, but I think I think I'm going to do that. I mean, it's um, it's more work than I thought it might be, but um, we don't have floods every year. I'm still here. Yeah, and <laughs> you didn't tell me about the BCA. Um, but yeah, that, that's been a real yuck uh, as well. Um, so who knows? You may be stuck with me for another two years. Great, because it's been hard to keep somebody in that chair. That is, it's, maybe it's, it's, been, it's, the... it's been like a one and done for for <laughs> a number of years. Yeah, Was it? Oh. oh, okay. Because you didn't want to sit next to your husband. I, I get it. I don't want to sit next to you. Got it. <laughs> so, Terry. Um, I I'll, I just want to say I'm really happy to be back in this room. It's just, it's really nice. And I was counting how long it had been. And it's amazing that it was six months, but also at the same time, six months ago, we didn't think we were going to be here at this point, right? We thought it could be a lot longer. So that's the good news. Donna, you're muted. So hold on a second.
Okay, try it now. Uh, thank you. I have to put my hand up to get her attention. So uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I'm also decided to have more fun and re run for re-election. And, you know, it will be really interesting. We all get challenged and we can talk about what we've learned and and how hard it is. Uh, it's hard with the engagement of the whole community when you have just these pockets of people talking and doing surveys and how to get a big picture to be a leader as well as to follow people's voices. So it's a real hard mix, but I'm glad to have all of you to work with. And I really miss not being there with you in the back in city hall. So I'll see you next week, still by zoom. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Donna. Okay. Mayor's report. I just have a few things to talk about. One is um, a couple of weeks ago, we had John Snell come in and do a report on the, um, on the farmer's market. And I asked him some questions about uh, the participation by in uh, food stamps or, or three squares. And I got the information from him and it's really quite impressive. The, uh, uh, Redemptions of crop cash alone increased by over $6,600 in just six months and compared to last year's 12 month average mm -hmm. season. So in uh, crop cash redemptions from May to October in 2022 were about 8,100 in May to October of 2023, $20,714. Uh, SNAP issued at the market more than doubled up to $29,546. Number of SNAP transactions almost doubled. And there's another program called Crop Cash Plus, which brought in another over $28,000 in redemptions to market. So for people of low income who have a hard time uh, obtaining good, healthful, fresh food, it is it really was very helpful for people. And I think this is uh, great news. Um, second, I'll echo, we had the uh, rally at the, on the state house steps this afternoon at lunchtime. Uh, there was, I would say a better turnout than I expected at that. Uh, there were a good number of legislators there because they're right there, of course. Um, we, there were a good number of community members there uh, to cheer us on the uh, proposal, legislative proposal by our two House members, uh, Connor Casey and Kate McCann, and their Barry City counterparts, uh, Peter Anthony and uh, Jonathan Williams, were all there. It's a 21-page bill, and there's a, there's a lot in it, and uh, it's... Um, Leadership at this point is not fighting this. And so you know, I think we got to work. We've got work to do. And uh, the governor did not immediately sign up and say, yeah, let me get get on this and uh, do everything you say. But uh, but it could make a big difference to, to the city of Montpelier and, and other uh, municipalities that were hit by the flooding this year if uh, if it passes even uh even a, a good chunk of it, not to mention the whole thing. And finally, for the people who are uh, who are still out there watching, I encourage you to go to the city's webpage and watch the uh, videos, the budget and uh, department videos on our city's webpage because there's good stuff there. And uh, all this stuff about, well, what do these departments do? What is this four person or seven person department do you get a lot of answers and uh, it helps you be an informed um, evaluator of the uh, of the budget uh, proposals that's what i've got city clerk's report gonna wait till you're mute unmuted Okay, that's better. Yes, contrary to what Bill says, I am here. 
you always think I'm not here when I'm not there literally, but I'm here and my report is simply that yes, it's election season. I want everybody to know we're in it. So now's the time to pick up um, if you want dummy petitions or, um, you know, for running for office or we're getting something on the ballot. Um, you can get them from the clerk section of the website or you're welcome to stop by the office. Uh, we'll get you all squared away. I don't have it in front of me and I should, but I think the deadline for candidates is uh, the 29th. Um, the other thing is we've got the BCA meetings coming back starting tomorrow. Uh, as everybody needs to be there. Sorry, my cat's getting a little here. Um, during that, we're only got a couple that we're going to hear. We're almost done before the abatements start, but I'll run a little mock abatement here. Well, Jack will run it as the chair, um, but I'll be a, a mock appellant so we can go through a mock hearing so folks can really, you all can really understand what we'll be getting into. Um, but that's that's it. That's all I got. Thanks. And cats do not contribute to a quorum, so... <sighs> Human members are required to attend. He's going up. I know how much you can see me going. Get away, get away. <laughs> City manager's report. Well, apparently we have a speciesist mayor. <laughs> Discriminating against four-legged creatures. Um, I don't have, actually have much. Uh, I think that, um, first of all, for all of you that are choosing to run for election, good. thank you. Um, and for the first-year people, um, I will simply say that the BCA this year was, you know, an unusual thing because of the reappraisal and, and the flood was an unusual thing. And, um, this budget difficulty is an unusual thing. So hopefully, uh, we'll have smoother sailing next year, uh, for all of you, if, as in, in for those of you that are returning and for those of you that may be returning, it would be, would be great. The only other thing I'd say is it is also great to be back here. I would note that at some point in the future, we may only have half of the room available. We are, we will be moving the justice center into that office and out of the senior center. So I don't know, we haven't really worked out with them. So just, we, we might have a smaller room working with, but for now it's great. Um, you know, all the city staff will actually have to sit up here where they can hear. So um, anyway, so that's all I got. Thanks for your hard work on this. These are, this is tough. Great. Okay. And at 11 PM, we are adjourned.